gives you all together. Kelly, I tag you as vice chair to take it from there until I can find a place in the house that might connect. The only thing I don't know how to do is control. I don't think I have control of the uh, Zoom, but I'll, I'm happy to just go down yeah. the list of agenda items. Yeah, yeah um, Josh can help with that. Too. Okay. Yeah, I'll be here to back you up. In case okay, Thanks. I should also warn you, we've lost power twice in the past hour. So if I disappear, that's why. Yeah, I think that's been part of the issue out here too. Okay. Who is it? I have well, we it. Are, here, so. We are now recording and we are live on YouTube um, for attendees that are listening in because we're, we're recording live um, and recording the session. Um, please avoid sharing any PII other than the, the normal where you are and your name and stuff like that that you normally do. Um, we, uh, we're going to use the raise your hand feature. So if you need to raise your hand, please press star nine if you're on a phone or use the raise your hand feature in the, in the um, client. Um, but other than that, I think you guys are ready to go whenever you want to get started. Josh, do I, I think I have the capability to uh, let people speak from the attendee side. Is that right? I will make that so. Okay, then I'll just handle that then. Thanks. Okay, perfect. All right. Um, I know Garrett uh, had emailed me. He's maybe in between places he was going to try and dial in, but wasn't sure if he would get uh, uh, access along the way. So he may be a bit late tonight, but since we have quorum and it's Jay's wife's birthday, I suggest that we get started um, as it is already 632. So I would like to call the Norwich School Board's regular meeting of October 7th, 2020 to order. And the first item we have up as always is uh, public comment. And I will look to our 11 public members. I see there's a hand up. So let me switch over there. I'm Stuart Richards. Stuart, I'll let you talk. Uh, this again, with this public comment period too, please refrain from addressing anything that's already on the agenda as we will talk to it later. Okay, Stuart, you should be able to talk. Please just introduce yourself. I think I'm unmuted. Yes. Uh, Stuart Richards, 82 Elm Street. Um, there's another birthday going on. I have a uh, seven-year-old grandson, uh, five, sorry, five-year-old grandson. And I'm not gonna be forgiven if I don't go to this, to join him at dinner and for the present opening. So <laughs> I'm, I'd like to ask your forgiveness to address one of the things on the agenda and then I will take my leave. If, if that's not possible, then I will just say thank you very much and I will, you know, walk on. Uh, is it related to septic, Stuart? How did you guess? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't want to get too much into detail because we do have a pretty full uh, report coming up and uh, you could always watch the uh, recording later. Why don't you tell me what it is and I'll make sure that we address it during that time period. What, what I'm what I'm concerned with is the uh, lack of forward movement. And I'm, I'm hoping that uh, having talked to uh, Dan Frazier uh, and understood that the requests that, that Hartford is making are requests that have been outstanding for, you know, I guess they're close, it's close to a year, but correct me if that's wrong, sounds like it's close to a year, where they've asked for Norwich to fund a, uh, a study um, to see whether they can accommodate what it is that we want. And the other point that I was hoping to make was related to um, getting a backhoe over to some of the possible sites before the winter sets in to see whether these sites are realistic possibilities. And that, that doesn't involve a lot of money, doesn't involve a lot of time, but some of these sites will be disqualified because the, the, the soils are insufficient. So anyway, that's, I'm just hoping that there will be some forward movement and that if you're gonna go in the direction of Hartford or at least not eliminate it as a possibility that, that you'll end up, uh, you know, telling them or finding out what it is that the, that the uh, study will cost and whether we want to do it. So that's really what I wanted to say. And thanks for, uh, thanks for hearing me out and letting me speak out of order. Now I'm going to go celebrate a birthday. Take care. Thanks a lot. Good luck. 
did did Tom um, get cut off? Uh, he did. He just uh, he did. texted me and said he dropped off. So uh, it's in your capable hands, Kelly. Oh, thank you very much. Um, next item on our agenda is, uh, is there oh. anyone else who has questions? I'm sorry. Anyone there else? There are two more. Do you hands up? Yep. Do you see them? Uh, okay. I, Josh, are you able to um, let Pam Smith in? Yes. Thank you. Hi, Pam, go ahead. Hi, um, I'm just inquiring. I can't see who's on the call from the public. Um, I got a call from Linda Cook, who is having trouble getting in. Has she gotten in yet? Uh, I don't see her in the attendee list, no. Okay, so she's having trouble. She dials in on her phone. And um, is there a possibility? Have, we do have one phone caller, but I can't tell who that person is. Does it end in 7847? It sure does. All right, then she's in. Okay, just wanted to make sure that that uh, she was able to attend. All right, thank you. That's all I needed. You're welcome. Uh, can we let Lynn McCormick in with a question? Lynn, it looks like you're in. Hi, thank you. Um, I guess this is uh, generally a statement, which I don't think is on the agenda for tonight. Um, so I'm uh, Lynn McCormick. I'm one of the many parents who were involved in the um, effort to support outdoor learning at Marion Cross. And I wanna thank Mr. Ganya and Katie Cormier and all the teachers um, for what they've done to expand outdoor learning um, this year for the, um, during the pandemic. I also wanted to mention at this meeting um, that I've noticed even with all the effort put forth at Marion Cross, the majority of academic time is still um, indoors. Speaking with parents at Ray School, the middle school and the high school, it seems like Marion Cross is actually the only one of our, um, our district schools that has really embraced outdoor learning to the extent that it has. Um, I think the evidence has been accumulating since spring about airborne transmission um, and including the acknowledgement of it by the CDC just this Monday, finally, um, when they noted that there is evidence under certain conditions, specifically in closed spaces that don't have adequate ventilation. Um, people with COVID-19 can infect others who are more than six feet away. Um, there's also been increasing studies showing that children can infect others. Um, so even before the CDC updated their guidance, Dr. Fauci has consistently been making the recommendation to do things outside wherever possible. Um, as we prepare for winter and there's more talk of spending more time inside because of the weather, I thought it was important to request that the whole Dresden School District reevaluate um, their district-wide expectations for COVID-19 risk mitigation to include prioritizing outdoor learning, um, which I think means devoting energy and resources into overcoming all the obstacles that were cited um, by the district in the reopening documents. Um, so I think they can also look at whether there's some restrictions that can be relaxed, um, like some of the focus on disinfection protocols and not sharing things, both of which are really mitigation for fomite transmission, uh, for which there's not a whole lot of evidence for COVID-19. Um, I think part of the discussion should include a focus on interior ventilation, and I understand that that's going to be part of, I believe that's going to be discussed tonight. Um, and I think that's really important, but I just want to note that it's not a substitute for continuing to spend as much time outside as possible. Um, so I've been circulating a letter that I wrote in consultation with a couple of local epidemiologists and public health experts, um, which I'm collecting signatures from some physicians and scientists from a variety of specialties. I'll be sending that out to this board as well as the whole um, the whole SAU board and the superintendent and assistant superintendent. My hope is that this will be con uh, considered at the task force meeting tomorrow um, and that the task force will soon be able to provide an update to this board about the plan to ideally update the Dresden protocols to be a little bit more in line with the current science um, and the current expert recommendations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lynn. <clears throat> is there anyone else who'd like to speak? I see no one else in line. Um, would any board members like to comment on any public comments or shall we move on? Seeing none, I will move on. Um, we, our next item on our agenda is the agenda review. Would any members of the board like to rearrange any items on the agenda? And seeing lots of head shaking. Um, we'll move on to the PTO report. 
Do we have a PTO report? I do not see anyone. I, I don't know. Alexa if... was there, Kelly, but I don't see her anymore. No, I don't either. Um, is there anyone else who would like I to? I see her in the attendee list and she just raised her hand. Uh, oh yes, see, she is there. Great, Alexa. Uh, <laughs> I was I was trying to wave my hand. Which Alexa, I'm so <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Um, I'll try to be quick tonight. Uh, various people have birthdays and things, and uh, my daughter's in the kitchen trying to cook dinner and doing a great job. So, <clears throat> so it's been a very busy month um, for everybody, but it's certainly been a very very busy month for the uh, PTO. We've had a ton of work. We've had a lot of. Um, challenges, sort of expected challenges, not unexpected challenges. And I think we've also had quite a few um, great successes. Um, one of the reasons, of course, that it has been um, a lot of work and very busy is because, whereas in most years, we would be looking at each of our events and checking in with the people who are chairing those events and kind of making sure everything's fine. This year, we look at each event and we have to completely reevaluate it and decide if we're doing it and if we are doing it how many dozens of changes we're going to make in order to pull it off. Um, but I feel um, very um, lucky that we've had some great shares of events to work with and that everybody's really been um, wanting to work as hard as is necessary to create um, some great things for our kids and I think also for our teachers this year. So I'm feeling good. I'm feeling I'm tired, but I'm feeling really good about what's going on with the, with the PTO. Uh, one example today is that we had our fall back to, uh, bike to school day. And we obviously had to do a lot of changes because getting um, you know, between 150 and 200 kids in a big giant pile at Huntley and then biking here all together uh, was not something that was gonna happen. And we created a really fantastic system. Our chair for Bike to School Day, Rebecca Reed did a great job and worked with Police Chief Frank. And we had all the different grades coming in at different parts along the route. We reworked the, we reworked the route. Um, and um, it all really went off very well. We, and we think we had something over 150 kids, about 175 kids. Sean led the way along with uh, Police Chief Frank. And I think that was really an example of the kinds of things that if we really look at them and we try to reevaluate them and we think about what are the most important things, both in terms of how to make it a meaningful event and also how to make it a safe event. And we try to prioritize both of those things at the same time, we can pull off some things. Um, that I think are, are, are really worthwhile. So I think we're all feeling pretty good about how that event came off today. Um, <clears throat> a few other things. I think last month I mentioned we were gonna make these uh, smile buttons for everybody and that project went off and uh, all of the students were given smile buttons to make it home so they can put their smiling face and they can show what they look like when they're not wearing a mask. Um, and according to my daughter, of course, I'm not allowed in school. According to my daughter, a lot of the younger kids wear them, um, fewer of the older kids, which is probably to be expected. Uh, and I don't really know about the staff because again, I'm not in the building, but hopefully some of the staff are choosing to use those as well. Uh, an update on the directory. Uh, the, the school directory is one of the two biggest fundraisers for the PTO every year. Uh, seems to be going very well this year. We've been pretty um, aggressive in a friendly way about reminding people over and over and over again about the directory. And as of today, we've got 134 families who've ordered a directory, which uh, brings us right around $4,000, which is, I'm pretty sure, quite a bit above where we were last year. I'm waiting to get that updated number, but I think that the directories, which will be nice. So that mean we'll have um, some good money for our PTO grants program and other grants. Um, tea towels, that deadline is coming up. That's always a really popular program. I encourage all of you to get a tea towel. They're fantastic. That deadline is the 13th. And our first round of grant requests, our fall PTO grant requests, which is of course where a lot of our fundraising money goes. Those grants are due on the 16th. We do not, as of now, have a lot of proposals. We have some, but we do not have a ton. So if you know people who are thinking of putting in proposals, please encourage them to do so. It's always nice to have a bunch of different um, proposals to look at. Um, and that's pretty much it. We're in the beginning stages of putting together, working with the Norwich Recreation Department to put together um, some community plans for Norwich youth for Halloween. So um, that's a work in progress. But um, as I said, we're working with Norwich Rec to make sure that our um, 
youth in Norwich can have certainly a different, but still a fun and exciting uh, Halloween at the end of the month. That's what I got. Thank you very much, Alexa. Any You're welcome. Questions from anyone for Alexa? And we will move on um, to the principal's report. And Mr. Ganya. So tonight the principal's report is without the apostrophe because Greg and I are both here and we each have a piece of it. So I have some okay. information and Greg's going to share some um, data with you from our first assessments. So I tried to keep my principal's report as low COVID as possible this month. <laughs> I think there are a lot of great things going on at the Marion Cross School that are in spite of COVID and that's what I wanted to highlight. So we First, attendance-wise, we have 264 students registered for in-person and remote, and we have 16 students who are homeschoolers right now. Um, I put a little article in here about the First Grades Monarch Project. They released their final Monarch today. Each of the students had their own little carry case and just in case we should happen to go remote, they were prepared. So they would bring their monarchs home, bring them back the next day. And um, they were well-traveled. And today the last one was released. And I put a little work sample in there so you can see some of the life cycle work that they're doing with their project. The fifth graders finished up their American music unit. Uh, Mr. Ramsey is the teacher who has utilized the outdoors for instruction the most. He's held pretty much all of his music classes outside under the big tent, um, up where the buses used to park, or out in the forest. And um, he's enjoying that 100%. He's wondering how it's going to be when it gets really cold, but he's willing to give it a shot. Uh, curriculum nights look different this year. They've been, instead of one night where everyone comes together and sees the classrooms and chats with each other and learns about the program, we split it up over two weeks of Zoom nights, um, which is great in some ways because parents don't have to choose with coming to one student for a, a little bit of time and then switching to the next one. They can stay for the full program for both or three or four or however many children they have. So those will be ending next week. We have one tonight, um, tomorrow night, and then a couple more next week. I'll just reiterate bike to school day, which was I think, in my opinion, better than the one last year, safer. Um, having kids come in at multiple entry points was brilliant and um, allowed the sixth graders to really get a good start. And then fifth grade joined fourth grade all the way down through. And last year where I felt like I maybe was going to get crammed between a herd of bikers and Chief Frank's cruiser, this year it was nicely distanced and much safer. There were no accidents. Um, and I just want to give a shout out for Rebecca, to Rebecca Reed, who organized most of the event and did a, a fantastic job, and Chief Frank, who led us bravely through the streets of Norwich. Um, we are continuing our co-teaching endeavor. So last year, we started a pilot for co-teaching, with which is a partnership between a regular ed teacher, a special educator, and the education assistants that has a different um, different philosophy for helping students who have disabilities. So rather than removing kids from the classroom and giving separate instruction, the team works together to make the curriculum accessible at many entry points for all children. And we, have, we had planned to have three classrooms pilot and then because of some switches, ended up with a first grade classroom and a fourth grade classroom. Uh, all is going well to date and we have our consultant coming to work with us again on Friday. It's gonna target those two classrooms and then work with all of our special educators about crafting um, great goals for students with disabilities and looking at how you make goals for kids who are going to be in a co-teaching room one year and then may transition to a traditional setting the next year and just having some consistency. Um, I wanted to give a shout out to the Norwich Police Department and the CPO, both of which caused a lot of cheer in our community today and, and always. Um, I think that it's pretty remarkable that we were able to have well over a hundred bikers still continue our bike to school event. And um, it was just great to see all of the 
people outside waving and cheering for the kids as they went by. And it wouldn't be possible without the PTO's dedication and the Nor Norwich Police Department's willingness to work with us. And finally, I wanna just give you a little information. We have three grants that are going to be considered tomorrow night through the Friends of um, Norwich Hanover Schools. One for uh, level literacy intervention kits that Patrick Gordon, one of our new special educators, put forward. And it, if um, granted, it will provide us with materials to work with kids who are struggling with literacy and try to, to mitigate some of the losses that some kids had for, from our extended vacation. And um, our new technology integrationist, Nikki Oni has put in a grant for ELMOs, which are projectors for teachers to use to be able to um, project from their computers or from a document and also for some various other technology devices that, um, that we're lacking that'll help teachers to do a better job and will prepare us if we have to go to a remote setting, we'll be ready for that. And finally, Leslie Dustin put in a grant for some literacy materials to help with our remote learners. We've, we're finding that it's hard to, um, if you're a remote learning teacher in charge of three classes, then you're constantly going and and trying to borrow from the classroom teachers. And there are some cases where that just doesn't work well. So she's um, made the effort to put in for some reading materials for our remote learners. And those are going to be entertained tomorrow night. And then I just added some pictures of some of our outdoor work and some bike to school um, pictures that I thought you might enjoy. That concludes my report. And now did we want to hear from Greg? Yep. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, can I share my screen? Am I allowed to? I do not know how. I think Josh can let you. Yes, you should be able to. OK. Makes me nervous being on YouTube, <laughs> sharing my screen. But I think we're all set. All right. So, hold on. so my, I'm just going to, I can't see anybody anymore. So if you want to have a question or get my attention, um, go ahead and ask. I know I have one misspelling on here further along. I forgot about to correct it. I saw it earlier, but um, we're, I'm just going to talk briefly about um, on the, if people don't know me, my name is Greg Bagnato. I'm the coordinator of student services at Marion Cross School. And one thing I do is help uh, coordinate the testing. We have uh, this test that we, that's an external test, um, but we do it in the school and we do it per periodically throughout the year. Uh, it's called Track My Progress. And I'm just gonna present on it for about five or 10 minutes. Um, it's a reminder uh, for all attendees here and for our staff, I'll, I'll share this with staff on Friday. Um, but really it's a snapshot in, in reading and math achievement. And it's a test that is, has been developed to get information about how kids are doing um, in relation to the Common Core Anchor Standards. Um, the, the test consists of 20 to 30 questions. Um, it takes younger kids, K through three, about, they say, 25 minutes, and then older kids longer. Um, the ELA test for sixth graders can take up to 50 minutes. Um, we've changed our... Okay, it's also nationally normed, uh, which means that we're comparing when we get percentiles back, we're looking at thousands of kids across the country. Um, and then we can use it as a screening um, tool in order to like, if we see someone that has a low um, score, we use that to consider if we you know, should uh, have some interventions. This is definitely not like the test that we start with, um, but it might be something to help us identify um, students that need some help. Something that I mentioned last year uh, was that we changed our levels. You can see this green level, level one, is above expected. And so if a kid ends up, if you remember your bell curves, in that last um, 81st to 99th percentile, that's level one. The default is lower than that. Um, and we're using that because our students were we had too many students kind of in the green and we weren't, we weren't seeing a variance. So we, 
it doesn't matter. It's just a way that we look at, we've changed the data a little bit. A lot of schools in New England do that because they do better than their national, uh, the national scores. Um, and then just so just to point out, I think it's important to see that level four, which says well below expected, it's, it's not quite. It is our lowest level, but it's the first to the 40th percentile. And if you're in the 40th percentile in a bell curve, you're, you're pretty average. You're not a standard deviation, I don't believe, um, away from 50th. So just to, just to know that going ahead. Um, so we, took, we take the tests. Uh, the plan is to take the test three times for third through sixth graders. And then the fourth test in the spring will be our SBAC. Um, we're planning on taking that this year although we haven't been giving a lot of information except to, to change our login for it. So it sounds like it's going forward. Um, and then the, the younger kids, K1 through K through two, will take it a fourth time at the end of May, early June. Um, and so these are the percentiles of all kids. These are kindergartners at the top, you can see, and this is for ELA or reading. Um, so on average, our kindergarten kids are in the 62nd percentile which that's why that bar is colored blue, because that is, that's as I showed before. Um, so these are percentiles, uh, and really I'm sharing this just to see how our kids are doing on average compared to a national, uh, a national uh, all the other tests in the country. Um, our math scores are right here. This is the percentiles again, and um, so we're start grade three is in the 57th percentile and then kindergarten is at the 73rd percentile. Um, something to mention about the tests, I've, the kindergarten kids have the most issues with it uh, because it has to do with reading. They, they can push buttons that read to them, but it's not quite the same. So we're also gonna look at other, um, all the kids are doing a, another test uh, for reading uh, this year called the POA. Sean can talk about that more some other time, I guess. Um, but those are our percentiles for math. And then the other thing that we look at much more are something called a scale score. So if we have a student in, the, in Marion Cross from K through six, we can look back at, at how their scale scores go up. Um, kindergarten is right there, you'll see at 431. And I'm just gonna skip if we can see here, the end of the year average score for this test is 486. And the other, the other important thing to see next to that 486 to the right of it is uh, the 108. So usually a kindergartner will grow in 108 um, points in the standard score. So that gives our teachers ability to um, kind of project how they should be doing in February and how they should be doing in May. Um, and then as you can see in sixth grade, a student would only typically go up 36 points. Um, and that just means that those kindergartners are soaking information in so much more. Um, so those are our scaled scores. Uh, and they're all, if you, um, I'm not sure if people can get a hold of this, but we can make it available to folks. But um, most of our scores that we start with now in the fall are pretty close, 20 or 30 points short of what's expected at the end of the year. So we hope that kids will go, you know, do, do better than, than that um, and still get all that expected growth. Here are our math scores, our scaled scores for this fall. And so this is a little bit of an interesting year um, in that we're wondering about, um, oh, it looks like I did fix that or maybe Jessica did, thanks. <laughs> um, we're wondering like, what did our kids come back to? Uh, we went remote in March and then, you know, they were really at home in quarantine a lot. So what I did was I just looked at all the fall scaled scores. So if you can see my cursor, uh, this would be kindergarten, these two bunches. Here's ELA and two years ago, kindergartners came in with its scaled score here. They went down a little bit last year and about the same this year. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but as we can see, there's, not, there's probably not a real big trend. I'd say that it looks that um, two years ago, kids came in doing a little bit better on the scaled score tests. And the other thing I'd probably say is our, our ELA, not always 
but in most grades except first are ELA um, scores, which would be, so this is ELA score. For first grade, this is the ELA scores and this is the math scores. Um, the ELA scores are a bit higher than our math scores. So that's an interesting thing. Um, and sixth grade did not take the test uh, two years ago and that's why there's no red lines here. So I guess what um, I would conclude from this is that we don't see any, you know, and we've looked at other data too, not just this, that we don't see kids coming back um, this year much lower than they, than they had the, um, much, much lower than, than they would normally. Um, and we have looked at things, I would say it's safe to say that if we have students that had less access to parents at home or enrichment activities over the summer, they've fallen farther. And that's, you know, just um, anecdotal, but they, they have come back with more struggles starting up school. While kids that have, a, you know, stable um, expectations at home and enrichment activities through the summer, even though they're in quarantine and we're remote, those students seem to do, you know, to do pretty well. So that's my report on this. And I plan to share it with you as we can see progress um, throughout the year. And I'm happy to take any questions. I won't stop my screen share in case someone wants to refer to us to a slide. Greg, Thanks, Greg, I also just want to let you know that it is attached for the public in four docs. Great. So if you love graphs, you can look at that. <laughs> Thanks, Jessica and Greg. Um, I'll, do we have any questions from the board first? I do see one in our attendees. Okay, well, let me go to the attendees and I see uh, Christina Aquila has a question and uh, should be allowed to talk now, Christina. Just please uh, introduce yourself and where you live. Uh, Christina Aquila, I'm at 633 New Boston. Um, Sean, you mentioned curriculum night. Is there a curriculum night planned for the remote family? Sean, I think you're muted. Thanks, that's better. Let's talk with the remote teachers because the teachers have been arranging their curriculum nights and sending invitations out. So let me check with them. Okay, we haven't heard anything um, in the K through three group. Um, that's why I asked. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Christina. Other questions of the board for uh, either Sean or Greg? Greg, uh, with this new scoring system, are you noticing already uh, better ways of tracking the, tracking the progress? Per se? Well, I think one thing we started last year, and it's going to be better this year, is that we're doing it within a two-week window. And so we're just, and, we're, and everyone's doing it. So, so sometimes if we're missing data, you can't see the trends. Because this is really not as helpful for individual kids. Like we can't say like, oh, this one child had, because it's a very, it's one math is 30 questions. There's six anchor standards in those in math. And then there's three or four questions. So you can't make a big judgment. But when we can see class data like this and trends over time, that's really helpful. Great. Thank you. Well, if there are no more questions, thank you, uh, Greg, for the uh, update on Track My Progress and uh, Sean for the principal's report. And I apologize for being offline for a bit there, but uh, it's good to be back. And I really can't wait to be back in person to Mary Cross Library, but that's for a later date. So, uh, Sean, I think you're still up with the enrollment report as our next item uh, for business requiring discussion. Okay, I'll go through the enrollment report for you. Um, we have 264 students who are enrolled. Pre-K <clears throat> currently has eight students all in person. Uh, we do have, ironically, a waiting list for pre-K, but it's for when people feel comfortable sending their children back into school. Uh, kindergarten, we have 25 in-person, one remote, and two who are home study. First grade, we have 29 in-person, five remote, and two who are home study. Second grade, we have 30 in-person students, seven remote learners, and five home study. Third grade, we have 29 who are in-person, three remote, and two home study. 
fourth grade, we have 44 in-person students, two remote learners, and two home study students. Fifth grade has 39 in person, four remote, two home study. And sixth grade has 36 in person students, five remote learners, two are MCS students, three are RMS students, and no home study students. I'm sorry, you said that was. 264 overall, Sean? 264, or, not counting our home study students. Our home. Okay. And, and are they, I thought that was the remote students. So they still are counted as part of our numbers. Is that correct? Well, there are two different things. So the remote learners are still part of that 264. Okay. Students who are home study students have made plans with the Agency of Education and come off our roster. But I'm still keeping them on our um, information list so that we can plan for those students to come back next school year. Okay. Uh, questions for Sean? Okay. Uh, Lisa has a question. Yeah. Um, I don't know if we're going to get to this later, but I'm, I'm just sort of wondering if we could have a little bit of update about how things are going um, beyond the test this beyond the test course, but just in general, now that we're four or five weeks in and the initial excitement over everybody being back in person may or may not have died down. And I just, I, I'm wondering how the teachers are feeling and what sort of feedback you're getting about um, both the in-person and the online learning. Sure. So our, I'll tell you that the, our teachers are tired. So. COVID school is a lot of work. It's very different than what we're used to. And, and they're working hard, so they're tired. But um, whenever we think about the alternative, which is to go back fully to a, a remote setting, we're willing to do the extra work because it's better for kids, we feel, and it's better for everyone involved to be able to come to school and, um, and have a school experience in person. I think our kids are pretty amazing. We have, <clears throat> I have only had to talk to one student about mask wearing. And that was a brief conversation that was settled with a new mask that fit her face a little better. Um, they're having a harder time with distancing as they get more comfortable being around them. But again, with reminders and, and with the reminder of if you guys wanna be able to continue to come to school in person, you've gotta work with us. They're good, they, they go back. Um, we have to continually remind ourselves that, that we are in the midst of a global pandemic and that even though things are going smooth at school and kids are learning and being more comfortable, we have to still be vigilant and um, making sure that we stay within the zones and that we do disinfecting and distancing and mask wearing. Um, but I think we are starting to, people are feeling more comfortable, which is good and bad. Um, but I'm hearing also from a few of our remote families that they're waiting for the date when they can come back in person. So I think that's a good sign as well. I think the area that we are struggling with most is still to be able to provide quality remote instruction for our students who are remote. It's a big ask of the two teachers who are doing that job to have three grade levels. Uh, Ms. Dustin has four grade levels and to to provide the instruction. So that's something we're still working with. Um, but I think overall, I'm, I'm pleased. I, I feel like things have gone better than I thought they would, would. So in the summer, I was a little anxious about what it was going to look like, how kids would react and adults, but I'm, I'm overall pleased. Greg, I don't know if you have a different or perspective that you wanna share with us. I would, I would, con I would say um, the same thing. I would say kids are getting, they're having seem to have a lot of fun, which does make them, you know, lax on some of the safety rules sometimes. So they do need reminders, but they do. I agree with Sean. They respond right away. Our families and kids are incredible. Um, we gave us, I don't know if you saw it, but in the crosswords, we did do a survey a couple of weeks ago and um, overall the respondents from families where their kids felt, they felt comfortable sending their kids is it, it was a five, one to five scale and pretty comfortable, feeling more comfortable than they did at the beginning of the year. 
Um, the kids feel like part of a community because that's something we really emphasize in this first couple of weeks. Now we're getting to more academics and I think kids are really enjoying that. Some kids, you know, they do want to learn. Um, so that's, that's been really good. I, I can't really imagine it, it being um, going as, I think we're tired. Uh, so I'm actually able to teach a couple of days a week, some tech classes. Um, and I just know that that's, you know, so I see the kids and they seem really engaged and happy, but I know everyone's doing extra stuff. And so we're all, we're all tired, but that's okay. I mean, I think the alternative is not, not um, super helpful, not, not something we want to contemplate too much, um, mostly because we want to be safe. Thank you. I, I just didn't want to assume that no news was good news um, yeah. or that things hadn't shifted since that last survey you all did. Because I do think there's a, a difference between the initial excitement and then sort of the, oh, we're here, um, mm -hmm. you know, and what's going forward. And I don't want to put you on the spot for right now, um, but I would love to hear what ideas you would have um, regarding teachers being tired. Um, Cause I, I understand that that's happening and we're, they're not going to get less tired in week 30. So I'm just, again, don't need to know right now, but would love some thought to be put in what you think might be helpful or how the board could help um, with that aspect of it. So, thanks. Yeah, I, do, I would, wouldn't mind giving a point that I just think that everyone, everyone in the building is putting in more effort, um, Jessica and Sean and um, custodians, and, that, and that's just, it's a little draining, it's a little different. We did, uh, we were able to combine some recess, recess, so we used to just have homerooms doing their own recess, so now it's all the same grade, and that does free up a little time, so I think folks, we're finding little ways here and there. Thanks, guys. You're welcome. I will say one other thing that's really tricky for us is people being out because the, the attestation form that we sign says, you know, even if you have a runny nose or a little cough that you can't come to school. And that's, I think that is as stressful for teachers to not be able to come to school as it is to be in school working harder. Uh, but it also puts an extra burden on the people that are there because our, we don't have the substitutes to to come in like we did. Um, and we're a little low on support staff. So it just puts an extra drain, but we, we do wanna support teachers in that if they're not feeling well, we want them to stay home. Um, so that's where Greg's been helping out a lot and all the teachers have been pitching in, but that is just one other stressor for us. Well, thank you all for all you're doing all the time now, and uh, we all appreciate it. So do pass along any uh, thoughts you have on ways to try and make things better as we move ahead and continue on this course. Um, are there any other mem uh, members of the board who have a question? I do see we have one from the public, and I'll go over there. No other board members have questions at this time. OK. Uh, Alexa, I see your hand raised and uh, you should be allowed to talk now. Just, uh, I know you've already presented the PTO report, I think, when I was gone, but just yeah, reintroduce yeah. yourself, please. No worries. Um, Alexa Manning, uh, 414 Main Street, also the president of the MCS PTO. Um, let's see. First of all, just a comment to Greg, my daughter, who's sitting here having just cooked dinner and is now eating dinner, said she's super excited to do tech, but she's never done tech, and they have that next in their schedule once they're done with library. So excited about tech. That was not my question though. Um, question is more just a um, logistics one with us having the cross state cross border school district. Um, when we're talking about what what we're allowed to do, not so much what the school chooses to do, but what the guidance really says we're allowed to do at Marion Cross School. Um, if we have a question about that, or if we want clarity on that, are we to be looking at the Vermont school guidance or the New Hampshire school guidance or both or we've gotten a few questions about that from parents like what what exactly are we looking at in terms of what we're allowed to do thank you Jay with your hand up <laughs> Jay I'll defer to you here great uh, Alexa, thanks so much. Uh, we, we are operating under a waiver from Secretary French from the Agency of Education in Vermont um, to defer to New Hampshire guidance. Um, we're, we're trying to do everything we can though to make sure that we're following both states um, guidance to the degree we can. 
So uh, where there are differences, uh, we are deferring to New Hampshire at this point. Um, gotcha. Yeah, so that's, that's where we are right now. We do, we do have, um, we, his, his, uh, his, his uh, waiver uh, didn't just come from the AOE. He conferred with the, uh, sec or the secretary um, of, uh, um, uh, really from the health department to, um, to also make sure that that, that waiver was appropriate. So we feel comfortable right now, but like I said, we're trying to make sure that we're also honoring the, um, the guidelines from Vermont. Great, thank you very much. Appreciate that. It's helpful just yeah. to know sort of what we should be looking at when we wanna just educate ourselves mm -hmm. and learn about um, the constraints under which you all are working as well, because that's- right. Oh, Alexa, I would also, I'd qualify it a little bit by saying that uh, with regard to quarantine requirements, we, we are uh, following the rules of each state. Um, so if, if, a, if a Vermont resident, you know, for Vermont residents, the uh, Vermont rules apply and for New Hampshire residents, the New Hampshire rules apply and they are, that, that is an area where there is a, a pretty significant distance, or I'm sorry, difference. Sure. Um, okay. So if, a, if an MCS family travels to uh, what's considered a yellow county in Vermont, then they need to go through the quarantine um, rules and regs uh, for that would that would impact Vermont residents. Right. And we'll be uh, we'll be having to, to provide some some information for all of our families as we approach the holidays uh, and we anticipate uh, an increased amount of travel. Great. Thank you. Sure. Thanks, Alexa. And thanks, Jay. Oh, we had a couple other hands pop up there, uh, probably, uh, I'm assuming, in response to this, too. So I see Nicole first. So, uh, Nicole, uh, please just introduce yourself. Well, you just need to unmute there, I think. Sorry. Okay. There we go. I'm Nicole Torres. I'm at 52 Norwich Meadows, number six. And... Um, First, I wanted to say thank you to um, MCS and all the staff and teachers who are making um, this year happen. Um, and especially for having a full day. I know a lot of the other schools um, have shortened their days. So um, it's really nice for those of us who have to be um, at work to have um, that whole day to, to keep our kids um, safe and learning. My other question, um, Jay mentioned quarantine and the holidays. So my question was, um, I've heard some other places are talking about doing um, a voluntary sort of remote learning period around the holidays so that people can travel. And I was wondering if that's something um, that has been discussed. Yes, please, Jay, thanks. Sure, um, uh, Ms. Torres, that was actually a topic for our leadership team uh, at a meeting we just had this week on Monday. Um, there are a number of different places, um, a lot of higher education institutions that are looking at extended breaks uh, between Thanksgiving and, and the holidays in the wintertime. Um, we're talking about that at this point, um, but at this, we've, we've not made a decision to, to switch to remote for any extended period of time at, right now. Um, we are going to be surveying folks to see what their plans are um, and use that information to inform um, our, our way forward. Uh, a lot of it does depend also on, on the progression of the pandemic, and uh, we're, we're trying to maintain flexibility. But uh, we, are, we are looking at alternatives. We're looking at some of the places that have decided to keep folks home between Thanksgiving and, and New Year's, and um, we'll, we'll address that together. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jay. Uh, I have another question. I see Anya is there, so I'm going to allow Anya to talk. And please just introduce yourself, Anya. Hi there, am I good? You're good. Awesome, I'm, I'm just on my phone, not my computer. Um, hi everyone, my name is Anya White. I teach fifth grade at Marion Cross. Um, I just wanted to echo what um, Sean and Greg were saying about teacher fatigue. Um, Lisa, in response to your question, um, I, I, it is not insignificant. Um, and I think there's, I, I can't see the participants list obviously, but I there are several of us that are here because we really care about the board business and we want to be part of it, but we're doing our best, but we are really tired. Um, you know, Sean, Sean expressed that, but just uh, if, if there are board members that want to connect with um, union leadership and um, we're happy to do that. Um, we just have our new officers voted in as uh, Tom, I shared with you. So that's certainly part of it. But I also would just say Sean's done a really great job listening to us and 
working ways into our schedule that we can have a little bit more time. Like the recess piece that Greg shared about is uh, for classroom teachers, a huge help, but um, it's one little piece of something that um, there's a lot we're doing that we've never done before. So many of us that are not in our first year teaching are as if we are first year teachers or first year principals or first year um, special educators. So it's, it is really, um, challenging um but i would just say we we do love being at school and we love being with students and we would not trade that for anything but we are very tired so um i'm just that's all i just wanted to say and lisa thank you so much for asking that question i really appreciate it thank you anya uh thanks for providing that perspective too and thanks to you and all your colleagues for all you're doing um yes and thanks for letting me know about the new uh, union leadership i'll i will reach out to you and i know uh, allison as well so thanks for getting in touch and thanks for uh, tuning in tonight as well yeah no problem tom we will be in touch great thanks again any other questions from either the board or uh, uh, public Okay, not seeing any, let's uh, move down our list tonight. And once again, thank you to uh, everyone at MCS and across the district for all that you're doing to uh, keep us in school and safely uh, as we move forward here. Our next uh, agenda item on the business requiring discussion is a, the uh, draft 21-22 budget guidelines. And um, the budget committee met, uh, we met. And it was recently, and uh, I think uh, I will let uh, Jamie start off if she doesn't mind with the quick model, and then uh, Neil and I can uh, talk about the guidelines if that makes sense. Jamie, do you mind starting it off? Oh, you're muted. Yeah, yeah I just had to move it over. Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, we met on uh, September 30th. Um, Thank you. Yeah, with uh, Sean Neil. Uh, Kim, who's the Dresden uh, and Hanover Budget Committee Chair, uh, Tom and myself. Um, we discussed the quick model that was done as of 9.30. Um, it is very quick this year because normally we would have had uh, all of the staffing um, budget sheets updated in order to project this forward because we've had a lot of turnover at all the different school locations uh, for many different reasons. So this projection is actually based on the census on which the budget for the 2021 school year was built. And it's been pushed forward um, with actual changes in what we know to be true at that point in time of steps. Um, I will caution everybody that we do not have any union agreements in place for the 20, for this year, the 2021 year school budget, nor do we, we're gonna start working on uh, union agreements for the 21-22 budget, which is, which is what this uh, will uh, help us build. So, um, you know, that being said, this may be, even though we've had a lot of turnover and we actually have had a lot of savings with some of that turnover that we've reported on over throughout the budget meetings this summer about our COVID costs this year and what some of the savings were in uh, turnover and of personnel, uh, which we'll discuss a little bit later. So just to give you a couple of caveats there. So what we do is we look at the salaries and then the benefit expenditures we push them forward based on what we know to be true at that point in time with a couple of um, assumptions. The assumptions are in the notes section on the bottom. Um, insurance is an unknown for next year. We're projecting a 13% increase here. It's included because that's what it has been trending between like 11 and 13 over the past couple of years. Uh, we base the um, Consumables, basically other program costs on the July CPI for New England region only, which was a 0.5%, so a half a percent. For the entire Mid-Atlantic region, it was a, a 1.3. Um, so, but the, but the lower Atlantic outside of New England ran much higher than New England states. Um, 
At September 30, we also added some known needs for regular ed classroom, including uh, math textbooks, software costs, and um, uh, payments for Chromebooks that are severely needed within the school due to our new uh, learning processes uh, that are in place or may be needed to be in place if we have to go to a remote situation. And those are included in the highlighted orange section, which was adjusted from our first one that we looked at um, at the 930 meeting. So you can kind of follow it across and then go to the 2021, 21, 22 column, and it shows you what the new dollar amounts would be. So for the K through six operating budget, when we push forward uh, what we know to be true, it's about a 2.9% increase. Um, we're, we are targeting the SAU 70 expenses coming off of that budget to be flat. Um, the special education out of district tuition right now, and apparently I'm not plugged in, hold on, I thought I was. My computer's about ready to die, there we go, okay. <laughs> um, it's funny, I plugged it in, but I didn't put the two cords together. Uh, <laughs> so the special education out of district tuition, we should be um, having new data on that here shortly. And then the regular ed transportation, that's just a projection because it's really, this year is a year that we need to go out to bid. It's our fifth year of our agreement. Um, so we'll be going out to bid here in the next month or so. Uh, and then capital expense, we've done status quo, debt services actual, and then interfund transactions. Uh, that's always a choice that's made usually towards the end of the budget building uh, cycle. So as built with assumptions, um, we come out to about a 2.73% increase over last year. Uh, if we were to target the budget increase using a simple CPI method at a half a percent, then uh, we would only increase it by about $31,000 instead of what we've projected at an increase of $169,000. $556. Um, again, there has been some considerable savings in some of the turnover of the staff. I believe it was in the neighborhood of $70,000 uh, for this present year. I'm not sure how much of that will carry over. Uh, we had a few people take one year, I think, leaves, um, which may come back. But we'll talk about that when we get to the section, uh, the budget, the uh, business management section. Um, of my report. So Great. that's where we ended up and we carried that into the budget guidelines, uh, the draft. Yes, thank you, Jamie. And so uh, with that quick model, the next part of the process we looked at was uh, potential new additions to the uh, budget moving forward here and when we're crafting the 21-22 budget. Um, and the discussion that we had, uh, those people at the meeting and the budget committee, Neil, myself, Sean, uh, Jamie, um, uh, thought about ways of streamlining the process moving forward uh, based upon the situation that we're currently in dealing with the uh, virus and the very unique uh, approach to our school year uh, and the need to uh, plan for the uh, the uncertainties ahead if best, as best we can. So the budget committee um, discussed uh, which items uh, the school might need, uh, what uh, Sean uh, thought uh, would be necessary that isn't and hasn't been on previous budgets. And uh, the only one that I uh, think that we had were those related to technology, uh, specifically uh, with regard to uh, supporting a continued or a uh, longer term uh, uh, remote learning needs of the district, but also uh, uh, bolstering some of the uh, hardware uh, and uh, software systems that we have at the school that are becoming rapidly outdated right now. Uh, and as it stands, uh, we the budget committee found that uh, we should just move ahead with uh, that need and not consider any other large new budgetary items moving ahead. So uh, it's, it was the recommendation of the committee to not add any other um, areas of consideration at this time. I think I captured uh, that in a roundabout way, but Sean and Neil if, and Jamie, if I missed anything, please uh, chime in and uh, add, uh, add to it. That's it. Okay, Sean, did I get everything that you had wanted? I mean, there were some specifics I know uh, that you might want to address with regard to the very outdated MacBooks that we have and some of the other uh, uh, software um, needs, but uh, did you want to talk to any of those specifically? I think we're all right right now. We're just 
technology in general is an area in our building that needs some attention, okay. especially with the thought of perhaps going remote again. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Neil, anything else? Um, the only other things I'll add are the stuff that I happen to know at the moment at the state level. Um, so a recent legislation that passed is going to cap um, EDM counts at what they were for the prior year, unless you saw an increase. So it basically sets a floor um, so that those folks that saw possibly a loss of students to homeschooling or to some other method of instruction um, where they wouldn't normally be counted in the ADM, those, are, th those levels will be um, frozen. Uh, the second piece is that at the state level, there was also a decision um, that the December 1st tax letter um, the tax commissioner is uh, specifically instructed to ignore uh, the deficit in the ed fund when they come up with the December 1 tax letter. Um, so uh, another thing to look forward to. Thank you very much. Um, I'll turn to the uh, board first for any questions on the uh, state of the budget and the guidelines as proposed by the committee. Okay. There are no questions. Oh, Neil, go ahead. Um, I, I'll just add one thing, and it's just a piggyback on that last statement that we made about um, uh, entertaining new initiatives uh, this year around. You know, I think there's a, a big desire on behalf of the budget committee to accommodate the needs of the administration this year, um, which is extraordinary um, during the pandemic and their ability to be able to actually uh, handle what's going on in their buildings and maybe spend a little bit less time, not a lot less time, but a little bit less time focusing on budgeting um, to the extent that we can streamline the process and um, agree at the outset that we're not going to entertain new initiatives that I think simplifies it for our administration. I don't wanna get into the final round of budgeting, present uh, a bunch of different scenarios and ask them to go back and cost them because we're thinking about maybe adding them or subtracting them from the budget. So I think the desire was to try to streamline the process as much as possible this year, um, eliminate the need of asking our administration to go back and do uh, maybe some more extensive cost analyses on other items um, and just to get to that, uh, that proposed figure um, as quickly and easily as possible. Thanks for the clarifying details there. And I do see uh, Lisa has her blue hand up, so please. I like the color blue. Um, I think Neil may have just answered my question, but um, a little bit of a follow up on what Sean said about technology in general needs attention. I'm just sort of wondering how we're gonna balance those two things of not asking the administration to do too much. We have limited money, so I guess it's three things. Limited money, we don't wanna burden the administration, but yet it appears that technology is an issue across the district. And so I'm just wondering how that conversation can happen? And is that something we're delaying? Or is that something that we need to push forward? Or I just, I'm, I'm a little curious since I wasn't at the budget meeting and I didn't listen in. So thanks. Yeah, no, to, sorry, I, I guess I wasn't very clear earlier. So with technology is the one thing that we are interested in moving ahead with uh, okay. in the budget process here in addressing the needs that uh, I think Sean, uh, and, and uh, colleagues at MCS are well aware of the uh, issues there. And I know that Josh is working on an overarching uh, technology plan too, but I'll, I'll let Sean talk to MCS sneeze and then Jay, if you wanna, okay. if there's anything you think from Josh's perspective or, or Josh is online too, so if Josh wants to. <laughs> Thanks, I just didn't see a line in the budget when I looked at it really quickly. So I, yeah. Yeah, that's specifically sure. not in the quick model because it'd be a new item. Okay, thank you. I wonder if it makes most sense for Josh to just speak of what the plan he's been working on that's overarching. Sure, Josh, uh, if you're out there and listening and wanna chime in, do you have a minute? Yeah, sure. Um, we're still in the process of working on it, but some of the things that I've been looking, and this is across, this is not just MCS, this is across the whole SAU. Um, but some of our challenges are not only the endpoints. So you kind of discussed a little bit about the Macs that are aging out. Um, on top of that, though, we have access points that are that are not doing so well, and we have a lot of infrastructure challenges that um, they just haven't been updated in a very long time. So um, we're talking about things like wiring, um, uh, switches, um, access points. Um, 
things like that. And we're, we're still in the process of going over. I've, I've collected a bunch of quotes from different companies um, and reviewing those and, and coming up with a proposal. So um, that's still, it's still in process and we should have that um, hopefully in a format that's available to folks soon. Um, but um, that's some of the stuff that we've been focusing on. There's also the challenges of just different software applications for these tools, um, the endpoints for teachers to use um, and students. So there's a little bit of discussion about that. Um, and just in general, um, there's, a, there's a couple other things. One thing that's really good is you took advantage of the, um, the phone grant that was available last year. So you guys are actually ahead of other schools. That's one of the things um, for E911 reporting you already have that because you took advantage of that grant. So that's one of the ways you guys are ahead of things. Um, but there are still a lot of other things out there that, that need help. So I don't know if that was too helpful, but we are working. Uh, that, was, that was good. And it, and it provides context that we're gonna have more details at uh, the other uh, budgets because a lot of this is gonna fall outside of the uh, Norwich specific budget. And I think um, what we're looking at now, or at least what we discussed with Sean is more uh, from a hardware needs uh, replacing MacBooks and that sort of thing. And then we'll have to hear from Josh on the larger networking issues too. I see Jay has his hand up, so I'll let him. Yeah, I just wanted to add that Josh is also doing a lot of um, very important work looking into the possibility of E-rate funding. Uh, so it looks like there's the possibility that we'll be eligible for at least some reimbursement for some of the expenditures that we're looking at. Okay, thank you, Jay. All right, any other questions from the board? Thanks very much, Josh, for the, the background too. Okay, if there are no other questions, we will have this uh, in a business requiring action item later where the board will be asked to uh, vote to approve of the guidelines as laid out by the budget committee. But we'll come back to that later. So next up on our agenda is a policy update. And uh, I think Kelly and I can go through this relatively quickly. Uh, the policy committee did meet uh, as well recently. And um, uh, we were looking at a couple of policies, one with regard to a resident non-resident tuition and another one with regard to gifts uh, to the school. Uh, well, uh, the gifts one specifically came up as we were uh, um, getting a lot of input and a lot of great initiatives from uh, the community on outdoor learning specifically. Um, we did uh, check the policy against uh, the ones in Dresden and Hanover and they are pretty well aligned except potentially with regard to dollar amounts that we may consider moving forward. But uh, I'll turn it over to Kelly here because we did decide with regard to both of the policies that we reviewed that they would be asked to be reviewed at the SAU policy committee level since we are uh, trying to do all things through that committee if they are relevant to all um, districts. But Kelly, is there anything else uh, from that other than that it's on the agenda there now? No, the only other um, policy that, that we um, briefly considered is um, aligning our Norwich policy with the Title IX, but that is um, in the works at the SAU level and obviously has to um, dovetail. So no, you hit the other ones perfectly. Okay, great. Yes, thanks for the reminder on Title IX, too. That was another policy that uh, has come through uh, as a result of uh, new law within uh, the state of Vermont, and I, my understanding is, too, in New Hampshire, and uh, we need to add it to our uh, list, and, and as Kelly mentioned, uh, review on both of those is ongoing right now, too. Um, so we'll see that uh, come back again, but probably at the SAU level first. Uh, so thank you to Kelly for her work on the SAU policy committee. As well. I would like to say a, a thank you to Ryan, who has put together an amazingly enormous spreadsheet of all the, the um, districts and all the policies. And she's now allowing us to be able to track and know exactly what's happening with each and be able to align the policies across the districts. So oh, that's great. That's very handy. Yeah. Jay. Just want to acknowledge that, that uh, Garrett is also a member of the policy committee. Oh. Um, right now, Norwich has a uh, has disproportionate representation on the uh, SAU policy committee. <laughs> Thanks to Garrett too. Sorry, I forgot about that. Thanks for your work there. All right. If there's nothing else, I'll move relatively quickly on from this because it still does have uh, business to cover at the SAU level. And uh, next on our uh, list is the Visbit proxy. Um, this is something that we have to uh, assign every year as part of the, um, uh, the voting um, 
aspect of uh, Norwich and its contribution as a member of Visbit. Uh, Jamie, do you want to talk to this or Neil is uh, in your role at VSBA? It's just, uh, Neil, do you have any background? Uh, this is just the annual meeting for the Vermont School Boards Insurance Trust. Um, uh, Norwich is a, uh, a client, um, you know, a member part of the organization. So um, as part of that, we do get one vote at the annual meeting. Right. And that meeting is uh, October 22nd at 3.30. And uh, we will also return to this later in our agenda as well to approve of the Visbit proxy. So if anyone is itching to be the Norwich proxy to the Visbit meeting on October 22nd, please uh, consider yourself the nomination at the uh, appropriate time. Actually, now would be even good too, but uh, let me uh, first address uh, another item on our agenda that we'll get to that might be uh, well tied to it uh, as a uh, discussion of uh, VSBA proposed resolutions comes up. But before we get to that, if there are no questions on the Visbit proxy, I will move down our list here. Um, just uh, a note, Tom, oh, sorry. there are actually two different dates. Yes, so traditionally, the is it? Is it? Yeah. yeah, been held at the same time as the annual conference, but uh, because of uh, the pandemic, they're different dates. Right. All right, we will uh, we'll return to that when we look at the uh, VSBA annual meeting as well. I should have kept these agenda items together, but they are separated. So uh, first we'll go to the facilities report and septic system update. And I'll turn to uh, Tony and Jamie, what do you think is best? Do you wanna lead with a, a facilities report first? I apologize, but I did drop off uh, and did not hear any of Stuart's question, but I'm happy to help address whatever it was at this point. Go ahead, Tony. Um, well, I think the facilities might be a, a, a bit longer discussion, so we could do that after the, if there is anything to talk about the septic. So I wrote down all of his questions. Um, okay. He was concerned right now about lack of forward movement. Um, he had said that he had spoken to Dan Frazier um, uh, regarding the Hartford hookup and Hartford's request of um, the school district in order to embark on um, the uh, study and report of what they could handle. Um, and then he also wanted to know whether or not we were going to plan to visit other sites or he was hoping that we would start visiting the other sites soon before winter uh, set in with a backhoe to eliminate the possibilities or affirm that they could still be used. So those were his three points, I believe, um, that he wanted us to maybe touch upon. Um, okay. And I think, you know, your discussion recently with Dan Frazier about Hartford kind of um, clarifies why we haven't embarked on that because there's a there's a process that has to happen first yeah. on their side. Right. Yeah. So, uh, well, I think we're all frustrated by the uh, lack of progress lately, but I think we've had a few other things going on as well. I think we do have a good plan moving forward, which uh, I'm sure Tony will touch on too with the facilities report as well in terms of uh, this upcoming year. Um, we have decided because of uh, some delays in um, the ability to get all the information that we wanted. Uh, and it's not gonna be on, we're not gonna be able to put anything forward for the uh, ballot as a warrant article this coming March, but are hoping to uh, be able to move forward with our assessment over the course of the year and uh, line something up in the near future. Um, you know, the background again is that we uh, have the reports on uh, where we stand with the uh, status of the green and the other three options we had initially. I think uh, I did, uh, Tony, uh, Jamie and I did meet last week to talk about ways ahead and we uh, do wanna return to some of the other options that are on our list, which include uh, looking at uh, eco machine options as, as well as some potential other areas within um, uh, surrounding areas, uh, which we still need to identify and consider and potentially ask support from others on. Um, and then with regard to the Hartford hookup, I, I wish I had been online because I'm not sure the timeline that uh, Stuart talked to Dan and I uh, exchanged emails with Dan, but I suspect uh, I might have uh, been after Stuart because I did ask uh, Dan to, um, as in his capacity as the chairman of the Hartford Select Board, if he would re might reach out to the uh, Department of Public Works to get a status on their uh, CSO studies. And I apologize, I don't have the acronym at my fingertips, but it is a study that uh, my understanding is they've been mandated to undertake to uh, assess the state of their wastewater system and which we were told last uh, January by 
the town manager at the time, Brandon Godfrey, that they were going to be embarking on uh, over the course of the year and it would likely take uh, more than a year. At that time, we had initially considered uh, entering into an MOU and having a parallel study on what uh, would be needed in terms of capacity with just what we were asking for, which was the hookup of Marion Cross and the three existing businesses along Route 5. Uh, but as we had more exchange with uh, Brandon uh, Godfrey and the Department of Works uh, uh, Director, Hannah Tyler, it became clear that uh, it didn't make sense for Norwich to pay for uh, a study that could be deemed irrelevant after the results of Hartford's uh, CSO study took place. So um, my purpose in getting in touch with uh, Dan uh, now was to uh, get an update from uh, the Department of Public Works on where they were with their own CSO study. And uh, um, we're hoping to hear back from them soon on, on that status. And with that, we'll have a better idea of uh, the possibility of uh, moving ahead again with uh, the request of Hartford if their CSO studies um, provide them with information that would uh, indicate that they have capacity. And then obviously we'd have to check in with the select board to see if there was desire as well. Jamie, did you raise your hand? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, uh, CSO is combined sewer overflow. Uh, thank you. Yep. I don't have anything more to add on that other than that, as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, Tony, Jamie, and I, and, and I'm sorry, Sean too was in the meeting and we're going to start uh, looking uh, back at some of these other options uh, with regard to the eco machines and, uh, and if necessary, other placements for a, a leach field and system, uh, you know, some of which we discussed previously like Dresden Fields. So did I capture everything there, Jamie, Tony, Sean, or if not, Jen? Okay. So yeah, I'll, take, I'll take over, Tom. Yeah, thanks, Tony. Um, so regards to the septic, for those of you who might have missed it earlier, uh, our system at Marion Cross tends to fit, it does fail or doesn't work properly in the colder months, January and February. So we've made a arrangement with the state uh, to, um, to pump our tanks with a, with a pump truck uh, during those months. We're gonna close off the leach field for December, January, and February, and we will uh, pump the tanks, which will probably involve you know a tank truck uh, once a week or every five days, depending on our load or if we're in school and all that. Um, and that should you know should alleviate the the issue of effluent uh, percolating onto the green in the winter months. And um, so that's that's our current facility uh, mode of operation for the because for the um, wastewater at Marion Cross. Hey, Tony, um, before we get too far ahead, I, there is a question from the public. You mind if I let them address that since it's probably related to septic here? Sure. Uh, Aaron, I see your hand up, so uh, you're allowed to talk. I just need to unmute. So. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, sure, Tony. Sure. I was just wondering if- Oh, Aaron, sorry, just introduce yourself too, please. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm Aaron De Silva. I have two fourth graders at Marion Cross. And Thanks. Wondering um, what the if there is a potential way to not close off the leach field, given that it's such an important part of what what our children need to be outside this winter, especially. Yes, Aaron, we we do not plan to put the fence up. The only reason the green will be shut down is if Sean shuts it down for safety purposes due to ice. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Aaron. Okay, so right, the rest. The rest of the facilities report is, is basically going to be on um, mainly indoor air quality and things that trigger that, and then ventilation uh, at Marion Cross. So I'll start. Uh, you'll see, you folks should see that we uploaded. A, unfortunately, I thought I did this earlier, but I didn't. So I actually filled it out today. And as I realize, I I need to make more comments, but I'll go through it and I'll make comments as as I go through it. And if um, anybody has any questions, just feel free to raise your hand, jump in. But basically this is uh, similar to what we do in New Hampshire, but this is Vermont's version of a, of a building check of triggers that you know, affect indoor air quality in and around the schools. Um, so it starts off, you know, talks about grounds and outdoors. Um, uh, are the uh, ground level ventilation Units operating properly, yes. Uh, ground level 
Uh, Aaron takes free of obstructions, yes. Uh, again, this is all part of the ventilation. Uh, we verify yet yeah, we've cleaned all those ventilation areas so there are no uh, nest droppings or other types of rodents. Are the dumpsters located from doors and windows? Yeah, our dumpsters are located 100 feet away from the building. Um, check potential sources of air, uh, air contaminants near the building, uh, such as chimneys, stacks, industrial plants. Um, the only issue I ever notice at uh, Marion Cross is we sometimes do pull in the neighbors in the wintertime if they're having a fire in their fireplace, we might pull in some of their some of their uh, smoke going out of their chimneys, but again, not not very often, very rare occurrence. Um, verify no vehicles idling near outdoor intakes, and we don't have any driveways. Well, we do, but we have a no idling policy on the on Gerard Way, um, so not a lot of idling going on over there. Uh, application of Pesticides minimized, yes. The only folks that uh, use pesticides is our licensed pest management company, JP Pest. Uh, report uh, proper drainage away from building, including roof downspouts. Uh, yes, most of the drainage, we do have a area we probably need to repair. It's a spot right by the walk, between the walk and the uh, front playground. That seems to get clogged up with wood chips periodically and uh, needs to be um, augured out. But I think that'll, that type of uh, issue will be resolved if we ever figure out this leach field uh, repair. It's all in the same, same area. Uh, outdoor sprinklers, we do not have any of those. Uh, verify no physical hazards present out, you know, present outdoor as well. <laughs> presently there are none, but there's always something that pops up, whether uh, playground piece of equipment needs repair or something. We, we try to tend to get on those fairly quickly, but uh, I'm not aware of any real hazards. Oh, except I did write down, I think, oh yeah, we have a couple of minor, minor uh, puddling areas in the wintertime that puddle over and freeze over, but we've started a, a daily uh, sanding and salting of those areas to alleviate that uh, hazard. Um, we also removed recently a, a ramp that caused a buildup of snow uh, in, from our plowing contractor that which also would frost and freeze and cause ice situations in the winter. So we're hoping that that's gonna uh, help next year. Uh, all of our building exits are not obstructed. Um, okay, we're on to, I guess we're up to, uh, yeah, we're up to the roof section. Okay, our roofs are in good shape. I wouldn't say they're in great shape. We have some really, really good roofs and some other ones that will probably need attention within the uh, next five years. But we currently we have no leaks and occasionally if we spring a leak, we get right on it and, and try to repair that. Um, roof ventilations, roof ventilation units operate properly. Yes, they do. Uh, roof exhaust fans are operating properly. Yes, they are. Hey, t Tony? Uh, yeah. Uh, I know this is a long list here, but um, given the time, do you think we could just hit on the things that uh, are of well, I thought concern it was going to be, you? you know, it would bring in, it was important for people, so. Well, no, I think, I, well, we've got the, I'm glad that we've got the attachment there. I think yeah. what would be great if, if we just touch on the things that are uh, of concern to you right now, and then uh, if there's other okay. stuff, we can uh, come to that a bit later, because I know I that. Know, uh, yeah, you know, I realize we did that out of the other schools, but I wanted to do a little more on this one. Okay. Yeah. No. Um, things that concern me, let me look through my notes here. Well, that was roofs anyway, we're in pretty good shape with roofs. Um, even though it does talk about uh, position of outdoor air, but that'll be more ventilation. Roof stacks are good. Uh, general considerations for the indoors. Okay. Um, one question they ask here is about uh, relative humidity. Temperature we can pretty much uh, maintain. It's uh, relative humidity, depending on um, outdoor air conditions, because we are subject to um, what we're pulling in through our ventilation. We have no, um, air, you know, no dehumidification or humidification uh, equipment in the building. So, luckily this fall, it's been very um, 
very mild and very low humidity. So we've been good, but other years in the, that I've been involved with the system that we've had some conditions where it's been 95 degrees and you know 90% humidity in the second floor of that building, which, which is not ex really acceptable or any, any condition, but, but this year so far so good. So that's a concern of ours, but that again, all relates to uh, ventilation. Uh, let's see what else. No, no, no. Um, again, just the I think we mentioned this on the other other um, school boards is just the policies of um, making sure our staff understand that the you know the hazards of bringing in furniture of their own or or chemicals from home. That's on this list. Uh, currently, I believe we're in good shape at Marion Cross. I think a lot of things that was um, passed on to our staff and a lot of furniture was removed. Uh, COVID helped with that, but that was one of the good things that came out of this. Um, okay. Uh, there is a, so it goes into bathrooms and general plumb, plumbing here. And in that section, again, kind of jump sections, but in the, I will talk about that a little bit because there is a part in here that, um, which is, it's odd, it's in, it's in the other section, but it talks about lead in the water, you know, lead in the plumbing. So last year we embarked on um, having all of the, all of the fixtures in, at Marion Cross tested for lead. We initially came back with uh, some positive, some action level hits, uh, which at, in Vermont, it's four, four parts per billion. Uh, I think we believe we had approximately nine locations. Uh, we were able to um, take care of some of those by removing old bubblers that were no longer needed and also replacing some faucets. And, so we did that on all, you know, on all nine locations, whether it was a faucet or a bubbler. And then we came back, we have uh, three locations still that are above the, uh, they came down a little bit, but they're above the, um, the action level. So what we've done recently is we've actually had a plumber come in and we've replaced the uh, shutoff valves in the wall, because normally that's the next step in from the faucet. And um, some of those valves were from 1989 when the building was had a renovation built. So we've changed those out. Now we are just waiting for our sample bottles to come in and get those three locations tested. And uh, we'll find out if that was uh, sufficient enough to solve the problem. Um, but we're, we're in the right direction. Those locations do have signs saying, don't drink the water. You can wash your hands and everything. And they're not, I mean, again, if you wanna put it in, compare it to New Hampshire, if we were in New Hampshire, all of our fixtures would have passed the first time around. Uh, even on this form, they talk about 15 parts per billion, which is not their Vermont's most recent uh, um, standard. It's, it's four parts per billion. So that's where we are with that. Um, and, and pretty much that's about it for that report. Um, now, I'll, anybody have any questions if they've had a chance to look through that on that, some of those questions or answers? Concerns. Tony, uh, Neil has a question. Um, Tony, thanks. This I'm uh, curious. On um, there was one item 4D. It was under the general considerations for indoor um, related to carbon dioxide levels are acceptable, and they just got a rating of NA. And I was just curious how. Okay. So yeah. So if we had so for ASH or ASHRAE standards, you want to keep that under um, a thousand parts per million. Uh, carbon levels, carbon dioxide. And um, we don't have any equipment in Marion Cross that tests for that. Uh, so I don't really know what they are. And typically what happens, right, is uh, I do have, so the Ray School has some of those um, in their thermostat, they have built in CO2 detectors. So I can see, see that on our building automation. And generally our classrooms, you know, range, even when they're occupied, they range about in the 900 range because that's what the ventilation kicks in and lets in some more fresh air. Um, so it's all about that, that sensor 
telling the unit what to do, whether open the outside air dampener or up. And, but we don't have those types of sensors at Marion Cross School. Um, we do, our equipment is set to the, you know, in a, in a normal operation, it's, it is set to a minimum standard of 20% uh, outside air, which most standards claim that that will be sufficient in a normal day. Um, but lately, uh, this brings me into my part of the ventilation talk is we actually been running Marion Cross School most of the time at, at close to 100% outside air because uh, the weather, weather's been so mild. Um, I've, I've been able to uh, have a program built for our, our building automation that I, um, I have the ability to manage that. So without the sensors, Neil, I don't know what the levels are. So it's not available, you know, but I do believe as a facility manager that we are bringing in enough air, uh, fresh air to, to have those levels under that thousand parts per million currently. So, I, sorry, I see Garrett's got a question too. Tom. Okay. Yeah, I don't wanna spend a long time on this as, just as a new board member. What's the process that you guys have for kind of implementing what Tony's doing and connecting that into the budgeting process? So is there, is it kind of a, is it work, you know, in kind of segregating between annual budget needs versus, and Tom will know that I'm kind of big on this, it kind of, you know, Ten, a multi-year, like a 10-year capital improvement plan where, you know, I, I see things like a, a roof may be in five years and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So how, mm -hmm. how does that work as far as, I guess, between Tony and then the budget and making sure? Oh, we have, so we meet as a budget committee, Garrett, um, along mm -hmm. with the principals. And we go through our, we started, Tony and I started here four years ago. There wasn't a strategic plan in place. So within the first two years that we were here, uh, Tony went around uh, along with a former board member, Jonah Roberts, and they did um, evaluations of everything in all four buildings. And as you can imagine, it takes quite a bit of time because you're doing your, your regular job at the same time. Uh, so Tony got intimate with the buildings and where the systems were at. Um, and as you can imagine, it's a work in progress. We learn new things every day. We've learned a lot in the last six months, I think, about everything. Um, so we had started with a, a rough draft of a strategic plan for the systems, the building and the systems within it. Um, and we'll start embarking on those as whole projects. And in fact, when we met the other day to discuss the septic, um, that discussion also came up about if we're going to look at septic and we also have you know, aging oil tank in the ground and, you know, our infrastructure in certain areas is aging, you know, then we want to be very mindful, um, especially if the interest rates still stay low within the next year or so as they are now, be very mindful of uh, all of what we might be able to embark on to get done at the same time that may dovetail into each other. Um, Perfect. Know. Thanks. And then, how's it? And sorry. And how's it work from my from a school budget standpoint? Are you actually are we actually able to put a little bit away towards like a ten year need, or is that not? Can you not yeah. do that in a school? So you can do yeah. that. So do we yes. have cap? Do we have reserves like that set aside for some of this? We do have um, a small capital reserve account set aside for building maintenance at Norwich. Yeah, and we have put some money into that um, in some of the different years. Um, and that's a decision that your school board makes every year on, on whether or not or what to set aside. Um, I think if we embark on a larger project, we'll probably do it as a, as a bond issue. Um, but again, okay. the bond rates right now are really low. So, and I, and I don't see that they're gonna take off fast, hopefully in the near future, but. Okay. Thank, yeah, I know this is probably the last thing on everyone's mind right now, but yeah. And if you need help with this, I'm happy to, you know, help out too. So just. That'd be great. That'd be great. That'd be great. So yeah, so Garrett, we do, as Jamie had mentioned, we, we don't lose sight of this. We have a, the way I do it is I do have the budget spreadsheet and I do have all these things listed and we've just kind of prioritize what we can do in a given year. But some of those, some of these things like these, these sensors that I talk about, it's part of a whole building automation package, which could would, would run probably into the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, right. So we do have that on, you know, it is on our 
grand plan or, or strategic plan, but again, we we started it, we we drafted it a few times, and we just got to keep going. And every time we find something new, like like I've really found out a lot, and I'm I'm going to continue to find out more in the next coming months, as I'll speak to now that. Um, you know, when it when it comes to the ventilation system at Marion Cross School, because we did have a we did have a site visit before school started with an with an engineer engineering firm. They mainly do uh, look at built at schools. They work with schools a lot to um, do energy efficiency projects. But since COVID had come about, they've switched their model and they're working with many schools in New Hampshire and Vermont on. Um, trying to look look closely at their ventilation systems. So we had them do that with us, but it was a quick quick visit. I think we spent a day and a half over there. Oh. And, um, but I actually just met with uh, the consultant again recently and we're, we're setting up another more two or three day intensive visit to look at some of these areas that they were concerned about. But on the, I guess the quick answer, the quick uh, version of the ventilation system at Marion Cross is we have some areas that are fine, um, which would be the gymnasium, the auditorium, the office administration area, the music area. Um, those have all, in our, in our reviewing of the plans and we're taking some spot samples, um, have, are fine. The areas in concern is mainly the exhaust portion of the class, some of the all, classrooms. We have enough, enough uh, the equipment brings in enough fresh air or air from the outside. It just doesn't, um, if the windows were closed, it doesn't vent as fast as it comes in. So you don't get a proper air exchange. Um, we, can, we can manage that by cracking a window in our classrooms, which we will instruct most of our school, uh, teachers to do this as it, went, as it changes. Right now, I, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, those are in the building, but I believe most folks open their windows up pretty much every day now. Um, but as we get colder and have to close things down, and while we still will, we'll probably have to burn a little more oil, um, but the units in the classrooms are capable of providing enough heat for comfort uh, with the window cracked um, until we can figure out what the plan looks like to to fix those exhausting ductwork systems. Um, so on, on top of that, we, you know, we, we um, also have looked at, uh, we, we've provided a, an air purifier filter for each room, which does, um, ones in the classroom will, will change that, an average one of our classrooms over there, like every 30 to 45 minutes. So if those are running, and, and those filters are good for a few months. We'll be, re, we'll be restocking filters for those and changing those out probably in, in November. Along when we work on all the other ventilation, we'll be changing filters out and all the other ventilation systems. Um, but that, that helps uh, also. We keep those running you know, Monday through Friday. Uh, so that's part of our plan to help, help with COVID. Um, we also added a, a custodian over there, some, some extra time to help uh, to clean. So hopefully that Sean and Greg and Jessica are noticing an improvement in that. It's only been recent, the person just came on last week. So, but that's probably gonna, it's gonna be a plus for uh, making sure, you know, we, we get all the, t all the surfaces touched and things vacuumed and it's gonna be really a positive thing for keeping the building clean. Um, so that's really it in a nutshell. We, you know, we found out in our, in our first go round that we just don't have the air exchanged because of the exhaust ducting, but that can be by opening the class door or opening a window, it gets, it gets, uh, it gets moved around, you know, gets exhausted. Okay, thanks, I don't know Sean. if anybody has any concerns or any questions about. Um, I, I see we've, we've got one uh, member of the public who has a question, but I'll take any board member questions first and or we can come back to it. too. And people can also read the review if they haven't. Uh, the, it's that is all in the report that was written um, on all the different schools uh, by the engineering firm. Um, okay. 
All right, uh, I see that uh, Alexa has a question and uh, Alexa, you should be all set to unmute and ask your question. Hi, thank you. Sorry to chime back in again. Um, Alexa Manning, uh, I still live at 442 Main Street um, and I am still the president of the PTO. Um, this question is more as the PTO person only because I had gotten a couple of questions sent to me from parents or chit chatting with parents. Um, and Tony, thank you so much for that extremely comprehensive report. And I think actually a lot of the questions were addressed. And um, one of the things I was wondering is if it might be possible, because I think it would allay a lot of concerns with parents, if we could get some kind of sort of brief um, communication that could be shared by a, maybe like a PTO email coming maybe from you, Tony, or you and Kelly and Tom or whoever is appropriate. I'm talking a little bit about the, uh, Jamie, thank you, sorry. Um, the uh, air exchange goals, um, you know, we've got a lot of scientists and doctors and all that stuff in the parents community. So sort of what the recommended numbers of exchanges are per hour, um, how we're doing with related to that, how much we can solve of that by just keeping the windows cracked a little bit. Um, and that, you know, keeping the windows cracked a little bit, even through the winter is a manageable plan because, you know, really all we need to do, it sounds like from you is, you know, burn some more oil, which, um, you know, we try not to do, but obviously in this year, that might just be something we need to do. Um, talking about that, all the classrooms, I think what you said was all the classrooms now mm -hmm. have purifiers, just something that we could kind of share with the parents because I know there has been a concern um, knowing that, you know, sooner rather than later, all these lovely things like, you know, keeping all the windows open and keeping the doors open as much as possible are just not going to really be realistic. And um, I would love to be able to share that with parents. And I think it would allay a lot of concerns and they would feel like they're being communicated with. If we could maybe um, put something like that together, it would be greatly appreciated. Yeah, we can do that because we've, we've done that for some the, mu the music department at Richmond. They wanted to know and, and I put something together for that. So yeah, we'll Get something together and, and maybe sh we'll put it in Sean's weekly focus. Well, I don't know what Sean calls his weekly letter, but yeah, um, should, um, that would be great. And, um, you know, maybe if there's something that's, uh, you know, if there's a, a, I know Sean has a lot of stuff in his, if there's a brief thing that could go in there and maybe a, a longer piece that we could put on the MCS PTO website, we do have a documents area. So for people who want to, you know, read a little bit more than might be in crosswords, maybe we could, you know, put together a little PDF and put it in the documents area on the PTO. Uh, website, so it have sort of some place to direct people who have additional questions. Okay, I would like to say, Alexa, though, I, I would probably like to hold off on that because I still am planning a visit with some engineers in November. Uh, sure. We are actually going to do a little more in depth, so I'll know more by then. So, I mean, I could put something together with some numbers, what, you know, what, a, yeah. what a recommended consult. classroom is, but we but can I, consult with the engineers and come up with a statement. Yeah, I, I, yeah I and I think even even just, um, I think communication always just, you know, um, um, so even if it was just a communication that says we had met with these people before school, we're bringing them back again in November. And after November, we're going to provide a report that's going to go, you know, out to parents. Um, just even that minimal bit of communication um, sure. it helps the parents to feel that they are, um, you know, they're being included in the loop and that they have a sense of what's going on. Um, as the cold weather comes upon us, that would be great. Got it. Thank you so Thanks, much. Alexa. Any other questions from the board? Let's see, we do a home. Go ahead, Neil. Um, just a comment. I mean, I think Alexa makes a good point about getting communication out there. Um, I would be just a little bit. Um, I, I, my preference would be that the communication actually gets issued from from the district rather than supplying something uh, to the PTO and have having them distribute it. Uh, I think for accountability purposes, um, we want those communications originating from the district. And I think it would be great if the if the PTO could maybe link to a communication that's issued by the district. But I I wouldn't. Um, I think I'd be hesitant to substitute the PTO as a distribution mechanism versus the district actually handling that themselves. Yeah, I think since we have the reopening website already set up, that's a good central repository for all information that goes out. But of course, we could uh, uh, reach out to Alexa and the PTO because it is a great uh, thought and uh, just make sure that she's apprised of the link as soon as it's ready uh, to send out to the group. Any other questions? 
Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Tony, uh, for the report and the update there. And I uh, look forward to hearing more from you as we move into the cold weather months uh, and the progress uh, that you're making. And, uh, and as uh, Garrett mentioned earlier too, we'll be in touch about uh, coordinating some more on the uh, more strategic planning related to some of the things you outlined earlier, Tony, including a, a concerted effort to uh, time things with uh, the ongoing septic review. All right, if there are no other questions, we will uh, move along down our agenda. And uh, the next item up is the Finance Committee, Norwich Finance Committee MOU. We've talked about this uh, a good bit uh, in the past a couple of meetings and uh, there are uh, there is a charge in there. That's the one that you saw at the last meeting and we signed off on. And uh, I had not realized or had forgotten that we um, had an, a need for an MOU in there as well. A uh, quick background on this is that uh, we're uh, uh, taking a lot from the current uh, MOU and uh, charge that uh, is in place now for the uh, finance committee as they review uh, town related budget matters and have added on to that uh, school related uh, budget matters as well. Uh, this is a one year agreement because I think there uh, is a need to do some more work on this with the uh, select board and with the members of the finance committee to figure out a, a longer term way ahead. Um, but in order for um, there to be a review of the school budget along with the town budget this year, we uh, did decide uh, in my conversations with uh, John Langus, and then I think that I heard from the board in our last meeting that there was consensus that a one-year agreement without too much change to the current MOU and uh, charge uh, could be a good way ahead. Those documents are attached to board docs, so if you have any questions about them now, please do let me know. Otherwise, uh, uh, we'll move on to... Um, to voting on it in the action item portion after which uh, assuming a positive vote we'd send it over to the select board for their agreement as well and this would take effect uh, relatively uh, basically immediately upon signature if both the school board and select board sign off on it uh, through june 30th of uh, 2021 any questions from either uh, school board or the public Okay, uh, not seeing any, we, as I mentioned, we'll come back to that in the action items. Uh, finally, uh, up here next on our agenda is the uh, discussion of VSBA proposed resolutions. Uh, in the uh, board docs of public content, there are a couple of links there for you. One is the report of the actual uh, proposed resolutions and uh, the other is a video, uh, which a nice video is put together by the VSBA that explains uh, each resolution with the members who actually propose them. So I thought that was, Quite helpful. I hope uh, other board members got a chance to uh, look at that. And uh, I don't mean to put you on the spot, Neil, but as the uh, president of VSBA, do you want to address anything with regard to the resolutions here? Um, I wouldn't address anything specifically other than to say that, um, you know, for those folks that may not be familiar, the resolution process is the primary um, uh, way that uh, VSBA develops its policy positions. Um, so uh, as legislative sessions come and go, um, VSBA positions on various matters and bills that come before the legislature, uh, those positions are driven um, almost entirely by existing resolutions that have been uh, brought forth by member boards and then approved by the voting delegates of, of VSBA membership. So they're, they're very important is I guess what I'm trying to say. Thank you. And uh... As I mentioned, I, um, there are recommendations in there from the VSBA board on whether to move forward with some of those uh, proposals. Uh, I, as my, I don't have it open right now, but my recollection is that they agreed to move forward with all but uh, one of those resolutions. And um, if any members have any, any of our board members have any issues with the resolutions as they're proposed there, please do uh, um, raise your hand now. Uh, otherwise, we would uh, vote on the resolutions as they're outlined in the, um, on the report there and vote on them as recommended by the VSBA board, or at least send a delegate to the uh, annual meeting at which that person would vote on them on behalf of the Norwich board. Sorry, Neil, did I miss something? Nope, that you got it absolutely right. At the um, end. It, okay. Yeah, you know, but it, hey, you got there though. That was the important part. Um, <laughs> the other thing that I would add is that um, we anticipate that there may be amendments that are filed to some of these resolutions and that there may possibly also be resolutions that would uh, be made for, uh, at the floor of the meeting. 
um, when I say at the floor of the meeting for those resolutions and for amendments, they actually need to be submitted via email prior to the meeting. We're not gonna entertain them um, in a virtual fashion um, on the day of the annual meeting. So uh, all that to say is that uh, the authorized voting delegate um, from Norwich um, would then just need to be given authority as well too to cast a vote for any amendment or resolution from the floor that may come up. Thank you for the additional detail there. And uh, yes, normally we would have done this at the VSBA meeting, which normally would have taken place at the Lake Moria Resort, but being times as they are, uh, I think October 29th, if I'm remembering, uh, not good. It is further ahead in our agenda, but we'll address it then. So if there are no other questions at this point, we'll keep moving ahead um, and address and vote on our delegate at a later time. Uh, sorry, one other thing is that what we ought to do is vote on a primary delegate and a backup. Um, we're asking for the backup in case the primary has some uh, technical issue and they're not able to cast a vote, um, being that the meeting is going to be via Zoom. We just wanted to make sure that everybody had a backup in case of issues. I don't see how that could ever arise, but we'll take that into consideration. Uh, right, moving along, uh, we're in our business requiring action portion of the meeting tonight, and uh, Jessica it ruined the surprise at the beginning here, but we do have the potential for a consent agenda. Um, we have items uh, B through F that uh, if the board approves, we can um, address all at once. Uh, uh, they are in the... Uh, board docs so members of the public as well as the board can see them there uh, i would entertain a motion if the board is interested in moving ahead with the consent agenda neil um uh, i i do think that this could be very helpful i think prior to um, making a motion of voting on the consent agenda though a couple things might need to happen i think you want to plug in the specific figures for example for f mm -hmm. approval of expenditures um, you'll also want to uh, author, uh, identify who the visit proxy is going to be and then the voting delegates. I think you want to get all of those in place before you then make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Uh, uh, the expenditure numbers are in there right now, um, but then this is only to approve B through F. So we're going to do GHI uh, separately. So the, the visit proxy and the uh, uh, delegates would be a separate vote. I Is retract it? my previous statement completely. Okay. All right. Did you want to make a motion? Move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Thank you. Do I have a second? Lisa, and uh, we'll do a roll call for the consent agenda, uh, starting with Neil. Odell, yes. Kelly? Christy, yes. Lisa? Christy, yes. And Garrett? Tom, yes. And Candon, yes. So thank you. And with that, so we can then move right down our list to approve of the Finance Committee MOU. Um, again, those uh, documents were attached in the business requiring discussion. Um, and since I just outlined it, I won't go into any more detail, but uh, would anyone like to make a motion about the Finance Committee MOU and charge? Kelly. Uh, move to approve the memorandum of understanding for the Norwich Finance Committee for the period of one year ending June 30th, 2020. Thank you. Second by Lisa. And uh, roll call. First, Anil. Odell, yes. Kelly. Percy, yes. Lisa. Christy, yes. And Garrett. Palm, yes. And Candon, yes. And Jessica, did I see you raise your hand there? You're muted right now. This MOU, this wording is ending June 30th, 2020. Should it not oh, be 2021? That's a good point. It would have been over by now. Uh, <laughs> Kelly, would, who, uh, would Kelly, you mind amending that? Same thing, and didn't say that. So I, I don't mind a bit. Um, you just repeat the. Motion. Yeah, with 2021. There you go. Uh, yes, move to approve the Memorandum of Understanding for the Norwich Finance Committee for the period of one year ending, ending June 30th, 2021. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. Second again by Lisa. And uh, quick roll call. Uh, moved around on me, but Neil? Odell, yes. Kelly? Christy, yes. Lisa? Christy, yes. Garrett? Palm, yes. And Candon, yes. Thanks. And thanks for catching that, Jessica. 
And so, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'll now send this over to the uh, Norwich Select Board and uh, John Lang specifically. And oh, Jay's got a question there too. Sorry, Tom. I, I just wanted to let you know that uh, if if and when people refresh, I've amended the agenda to reflect ah. the, the proper year. Thank you very much. I'm sure it was my fault anyway. Thank you. All right, uh, moving right along, we'll go down to the uh, approval of the Visbit proxy. This uh, meeting is one, as I mentioned earlier, is going to take place on October 22nd at 3. Oh, Jamie, would I miss something? Oh, I, I'm way down there, aren't I? No. no. Budget <laughs> guidelines is what I meant to say. <laughs> Thank you. I was getting so excited about moving ahead. So budget guidelines is our next action item. And uh, we've talked about this in detail, so I'm happy to entertain a motion for these as well. Neil. Move to approve the budget guidelines as presented. Thank you. I have a second. Elisa, uh, and we'll do roll call. Kelly. Percy, yes. Lisa. Christy, yes. Neil. Odell, yes. Garrett. Garrett, yes. And Candon, yes. And Jessica, is your hand just up from before? Yes, I don't know how to put it down. Oh, right, yeah. I'll just put it down for you. All <laughs> Thank right. you. Thanks. All right, uh, moving right along back to the Visbit proxy, which is next on our list here. And as I mentioned, it's October 22nd meeting. It takes place at 3.30. These meetings don't normally take more than half an hour, as I recall from previous in-person meetings. Would anyone like to volunteer to participate in this meeting? Um, what was the date? I'm sorry. October 22nd at 3.30, and it is remote. Um, I could probably, Lisa, I can, I can probably I can do it as of right now. Yeah. So, okay. All right. You back up if you want to back up. Okay. Um, let me see if we can, uh, well, let's do, well, let's do alternate delegates. I think we could do that. Um, I don't mind serving as a, a lead. And then if uh, Lisa wants to be an alternate, uh, that would be great. Would someone mind making that motion? Uh, so that was you as the, the yeah, delegate. I'll be I'll be the delegate and then Lisa's the alternate. Uh, move to authorize Tom Cannon as the Visbit proxy for the Visbit annual meeting. With Lisa as the alternate? With Lisa as the alternate. Thank you. Seconded by Kelly. Um roll call Kelly. Christy, yes. Lisa? Christy, yes. Neil? Odell, yes. Garrett? Tom, um, yes. And Candon, yes. Thank you. Uh, next on our list is the approval of the VSBA proposed resolutions, as well as the appointment of a voting delegate. And, uh, and as discussed earlier, let's do an alternate here as well. Um, do I have any volunteers for delegates? Neil, will you be there in your capacity as the uh, President? Uh, I will be. So I don't think that it would be appropriate for me to be the Norwich delegate. Okay. I actually, I'm sorry. I, I should have looked at my calendar. Can yeah. you, I don't have it open right now. Neil, can you tell me the actual 29th at 5 p.m. 5 p.m. on the 29th. Uh, I'm happy to do it. Great. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, and uh, I wouldn't mind serving as your delegate. So um would someone make a motion to that effect please and actually i'm sorry it, it would be a motion to uh make kelly the delegate me the alternate and to approve of the proposed resolutions as uh suggested by the vsba board I'll give it a go thanks now uh, move to authorize Kelly Hersey as the voting delegate and Tom Cannon as the alternate for the VSBA annual meeting. Um, authorized to cast votes in accordance with the board recommendations for the resolutions from the VSBA um, and to cast any other vote as necessary for any amendments and resolutions from the floor. Thank you. Do I have a second? Lisa, I'll do a roll call. Kelly? Hersey, yes. Uh, Tony, you scared me for a second. Lisa? Christy, yes. Neil. Odell, yes. Garrett. Palm, yes. And Candon, yes. Thank you. So uh, Kelly, put it on your calendar now, please. And I'll do the same and let me know if uh, anything comes up. 
And uh, yes, um, Tony, the mask. I just, I put my mask on because I want to go home. So I'm going to sign off. <laughs> Thank Thanks. you for everything. Have a good night. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Good to see you. Thanks, Tony. You too. Take yep. it easy. All right, that brings us to the conclusion of our business requiring action. So we'll get into communications and reports. First up is the uh, report of the chair. Um, I uh, have spoken a good deal thus far. I don't have a lot more to add. It says in the board docs that I'll report on any recent state legislative updates. Uh, I think Neil gave us a nice overview from the budget perspective. You do get the VSBA updates on the legislative reports. I may check in. Um, I will check in with our representatives, uh, Tim Briglin and Jim Maslin to see if they have anything that they'd like to pass along because it has been a while since I'd checked in with them recently and see if they've got any thoughts on uh, future uh, work uh, that they see coming along or anything we need to be thinking about as we enter into our budget process here. Um, other than that, I, even if you're not a delegate or uh, alternate to the upcoming uh, VSBA meeting, I do encourage you to uh, zoom into that um if you're able and uh i actually missed uh last night's uh, last night's regional meeting but uh, i know a couple of you were there uh, neil and uh, lisa neil is that meeting recorded and going to be available for board members um i don't know let me let me check the um the i don't think that the business meeting portion of it was um recorded which was just the election of a new board member for the windsor area region um the other half of the meeting included um uh, a, a pre-recorded presentation from uh officials from the vermont department of health um, related to um covid19 uh issues such as contact tracing um what do you do if you've got a positive case in your school and things like that um, uh, I think that piece may have been recorded. Um, the other piece that I will add to is that we did have uh, a legislative um, recap of uh, the special session um, this afternoon from 3.30 to 5.30. Um, and that uh, webinar was recorded. Um, it included um, an overview of some of the policy issues that were decided in the special session, as well as um, a fiscal uh, recap as well. Um, uh, including Mark Peralt from the Joint Fiscal Office and um, uh, Brad James from AOE. Great, thanks very much. I missed that as well. But uh, uh, as Neil said, those and, and previous webinars are always uh, made available through the VSBA website, which is a great resource. So I strongly encourage uh, board members to go there to check that out. Um, I don't have any more uh, updates from my perspective at this time. So if, uh, if you don't mind, Jay, I'll turn it over to you for a superintendent's report and then hopefully a birthday party. <laughs> Great, thanks, Tom. Um, first of all, I wanna echo uh, Sean's comments as appraisal of the performance of uh, the staff, the whole staff at Marion Cross School, as well as the families and parents, kids. Um, it, it's, it's really been far and above my expectations. Um, having visited a few times and seen our teachers in action, seen our students learning, uh, it's, it's uh, really been amazing to see. And especially when you consider the context. Uh, last week, I, I got to spend some time out in the forest with a with, um, number of different classes that were out there doing art projects and, and working with, um, with literature. Um, just really amazing to see. And, uh, and, and, and really um, what I noticed most uh, kind of reflects Anya's comment is that the teachers were, in, were engaging their students. They were, they were doing an outstanding job at their craft. And then it, it came time for a student dismissal. And I saw a few teachers uh, go from this sort of exuberant uh, onstage teaching mode to, to just like a, a posture of exhaustion. Um, and I spoke to a couple of them and, and, and they, they just shared that, that exactly what Anya said earlier, they're in it, they are dedicated to making sure this works. Uh, they would prefer this to teaching remotely, but it is hard for everyone. It, and and I, I know several people have already said it. Uh, and, and I know those of you who are, who are doing your own jobs, I mean, our, all of our work is different than it used to be. 
And there is a breaking point. And one thing I'm concerned about is that um, stress reduces the, the body's ability uh, to ward off disease. Uh, it, it weakens your immune system. And um, the, I guess the, the former medic in me that used to advise the command on ways to keep our troops healthy uh, feels the same way about our staff right now. Everybody from the folks in the central office uh, who, are, who are doing multiple jobs um, for extended hours uh, and with a, with a lot of additional concerns and, and considerations to our teachers who are having to implement all sorts of safety precautions in addition to doing their work, um, to our administrative support staff, everybody is doing a lot more. And they're doing it with, uh, with a lot of anxiety about what could happen if, if we actually see a resurgence in the disease. So that's, there's all these different factors that are, that are sort of um, cumulative. And uh, I'd, I'd like to work with the board, I'd like to work with the administration to figure out some ways that we can pr provide at least some sort of um, pressure release. Uh, one thing that we're working on for Friday's um, in-service day is to allow some flexibility around, um, around remote options for that. Um, but I think we need, to, we need to take a look at our calendar. We need to look at um, the possibility for some breaks that may extend the school year, but may make it possible for our folks to, to sustain this effort because they're doing a great job. To the outside observer, you see what's going on and you're, you're amazed that like kids are happy and, and learning is happening. And it, it looks almost like business as usual, except with masks. Um, but that takes an incredible amount of effort. And, um, and I'm deeply appreciative, but I'm also really sensitive to the fact that, that that's something that we need to really keep an eye on because we're coming into cold and flu season um, and we don't want people coming into it with weakened immune systems. So that's my report. I, I, I will continue to work with the leadership team and the boards um, to figure out ways to prevent that from becoming a big problem. And I just want to extend my deep appreciation and just admiration for the work that everyone's doing. Thanks, Jay. That's uh, very well said. I want to thank uh, you as well for all the work you're doing and uh, Jamie and Robin out of the uh, SAU office, as well as everyone else there. Uh, Tony, previously, everyone that wasn't on the call tonight, that's been extraordinary and it, it has not gone unnoticed. So thank you for that as well. So we've been very appreciative. I know the board members are. There's been a lot of traffic behind the scenes that you're not always included on because we figure you've got a pretty big inbox as well. Uh, but we are uh, extremely appreciative and of all that the teachers are doing too and have heard loud and clear of the need to address ways to um, de-stress and, uh, and help uh, provide some breathing room for the, the folks who are putting in so much right now. So I look forward to working with you on that moving ahead too. And whatever the board can do to support it, just uh, let us know, please. Um, yeah, I see Garrett's got a question. Uh, it, it was a question, it's a comment. I do think tonight's meeting has been a bit eye-opening for me as a board member. And I do think Jay and Sean and others, like, I think we do need to take this seriously as far as, you know, asking the teachers and kind of figuring out a solution here so that we're not just kind of, you know, kind of all shaking our heads and saying, yeah, 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 like, it's not a big, like, you know, it's tough and we thank you. I think, I don't know what the solution is, but I think we should think about a real solution. And I don't know if that's, you know, you know, like you said, Jay, I was thinking, you know, well, we may take a couple of days off over the next couple of weeks and, ex and put it as a snow day at the, in the spring or something. And, and maybe we'd be creative about that so that it's not a Friday so everyone doesn't travel and we do it like on a Wednesday so everyone has to stay in town. Maybe we do a couple other shorter days. Um, and I will tell you with three kids in the school system, the kids are also tired. So it does like, you know, it's everyone that could probably benefit from, and the mornings are early and it's getting dark and like, you know, it's nice to see Sean every morning. And so, you know, everyone's all like, yeah, it's great. But you can tell like, you know, that then we all drive off and, and you know, it, we kind of go on with our lives. And so I think we do have to take this seriously. So that's my comment. And not wait till the next board meeting even to like think about what we can do. I think we need to action this and make sure that people's, you know, issues are heard because, you know, no one's making extra money doing this right now, right? They're just working twice as hard. Um, and if they're getting sick and not happy and all that, we got to be, I think, figure out a way to action it. So enough said. Thanks very much. Agreed.
Any others? All right. Thank you, Jay. Happy birthday to your wife. <laughs> Have a good night. Thanks. I'm, I'm going to bow out. Please do. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Jay. Sure. Next up is the business administrator's report. So Jamie has a lot of materials in here for us. And uh, if you want to go through those. I'm going to go first next time. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I've run quarterly reports. Thanks for Josh's help because I was having trouble earlier with the software not wanting to cooperate. Um, I'm not gonna go over them. You can read them. They're early, obviously, cause school's only been open for about a month. And we were on a very tight leash for the months of July and August on ordering uh, due to the potential for uh, strangled cash flow. Although the town has been amazing at sending us money. As you'll see, if you look in the revenue report, I think we're, I think they've sent us $5 million already. So, um, there's been no issues with cash flow at this point, but we are still monitoring it closely and keeping, you know, we're only ordering what we need. Okay, we're not ordering in quantities to stockpile. Um, I've also attached updated, and these are updated and were shared with the um, uh, the budget chairs, uh, although probably not Neil, because I don't know if I had it done the last time we met, it was right after that. Uh, I updated the COVID related cost savings, revenue gains and other negative changes and net differences between the two. Um, and that's dated October 4th. So that's based on what we're actually doing right now because when we first started this adventure, we thought that we might um, have large costs in different um, employee realms which we're not seeing right at the moment that can change okay so these are a snapshot in time uh, based on what we're trending right now i uh, just wanted to update them um, we also thought we'd have to run a whole bunch of additional uh, bus runs which we're not doing um, so we've updated some of that information so that's also there for you the other two things I just wanted to touch upon very quickly are uh, two potential MOUs that we're working through. Uh, one is, I didn't notice that, it says ED Fiber. I'm sorry, it's EC Fiber. Uh, EC Fiber actually has a hub that has been within our school in, our, in a little closet uh, for many years, way before me, even before John Minnelli. So, um, you know, they came forward and notified Tony and said, hey, we'd like to update, you know, the, the quality and the age of the equipment that resides within that room that we use at your school. And so we get free uh, service from them because that, that was an agreement that was made way back, um, which lit, then landed on my desk because I usually review contractor and we'll use and everything. And I said, okay, let me see where the last one, you know, what the other one looked like and come to find out we can't find anything in writing and about agreement on, <laughs> on them being in our building. But uh, that's okay because we're going to move forward and just write a new one. Uh, and in fact, Sean was involved in the decision making as well as Josh and Tony. And we're going to be hopefully moving the location of that to a better suited location uh, and upgrading the equipment, which will both help the school district and the residents uh, of the town of Norwich uh, who have internet uh, accessibility through that company. The other item um, is that Ms. Richards, who lives on Church Street, just behind the school, um, has been very kind in um, allowing us to use a portion of her property. Um, and we need to make that formal in order to insulate her from any liability. Um, so that's in the works as well. We don't have it for you tonight. I just wanted to let you know that those will most probably be uh, brought forward at the next meeting, uh, as long as we can work through all of the pieces and they are um, they're at our lawyer's office right now for review. Okay. Um, I don't think, I think Tony had, you know, done a pretty bang up job on all that's going on there. Um, food service, we're working through that. Uh, busing, I don't think I need to tell you how busy that's been. Um, you know, we continue to make changes to try to improve the times of the rides and 
the locations of the rides and you know we'll continue to look at that i've had conversations with a couple of parents um and so i, I hear you loud and clear and we're doing the best we can with the amount of resources that we have um we've made some changes that were effective this past tuesday and we've any of the changes that we affect we put on the transportation page on the website as well as the covid back to school page um, but at, you know anybody can contact myself or Karen Wright in the office. Uh, I want to thank all of the bus monitors who came forward to work for us. Uh, some really great Norwich residents are, are you know stepping up and and working for us in that respect, and they've done a great job. Uh, we've been very happy and fortunate uh, to have them. Um, from college kids to you know retirees, it's been great, and some of our parents. Uh, so. So we're making it through. Uh, I think that's all my realms other than HR, but uh, HR has been super duper duper busy and we're still, you know, catching up. So. Well, thanks for all you're doing. Yeah, it's been fun. <laughs> it's fun. Uh, I've got a couple of hands up. Garrett, is your hand up from earlier? Or? Oh, no, sorry. I'll take that down. Okay. Uh, Lisa, though, does have her hand up. Yeah. Um just your your comment about the bus monitors reminded me of a question I had. Um, would it be helpful to have kind of an equivalent of bus monitors in the schools, just three or four adults who the administrators and teachers could use as needed to help ease some of the stress? I don't know, like just to do the cleaning or to provide coverage for the kids while a teacher had to go to a meeting or I don't, I don't know, it just, the bus monitor thing just made me realize there might be a way to use some non-educator adults in the schools to help with some non-educator stuff that the teachers are being asked to do um, as part of a solution for relieving some of the stress. I know it's not the full solution, but it just occurred to me when I heard the bus monitor comment. Oh, so right now we're not allowed to have volunteer help in the schools? No, this would be paid. Yeah. yeah. So I would encourage anybody who would like to do, um, you know, any kind of help in the schools to please, you know, fill out an application uh, as a substitute because they do call on subs to come into the buildings when they need them. Um, and or if they would like to, you know, work in any type of aid capacity. But yeah, I think if they were signed up as subs and and let Sean know, you know, um, when they sign up that I'm willing to do, you know, whatever it takes. Um, I think Sean and his team probably then could, you know, go to the sub roles and, and contact people and say, yeah, we could use you on these, these certain days. I'm sure Sean can speak to that better than I can. And there would be enough money to sort of be able to do this because I realize this would cost money. Um, okay, thanks, Jamie. Go ahead, Sean. I, I'll just say that one of the things we're being cautious about, we had some staff that were reluctant to come back. So part of our agreement as a staff was that we would minimize the number of bodies inside our building. But I think that there are some things like maybe helping with the morning check-in at certain locations that could free staff up from not having to come so early. But we have as a staff kind of agreed that um, the staff would rather take on a little more and not have outside bodies brought in with potential germs. Um, but I think we can look at the things that are outside the school and see where we can find some help in that area. And Thanks, I, I realize this might not be the right time to brainstorm, but it just occurred to me, so. And, and while I'm speaking, I just wanna put a, a shout out to Jamie because she's done the job of like 12 people. And I, I'm convinced that we wouldn't have the PPE that we need or the buses set up or a multitude of things done if she hadn't taken the lead on them. So I, I know that you know how fortunate we are to have her, but I don't think it hurts enough to say that. that thank you, you've done a great job with all I that. have a really good team, you know that. It's not, it's, one person can never get a job done. It's a team effort, but thank you. I appreciate that. And I will refer, I will bring that back to my team. Well said all around. Um, any other questions at this time? All right, thanks for the report, Jamie, and thanks, as Sean said, for all you and your team are doing.
Uh, next on our agenda is our committee reports. And actually, I think we've addressed uh, most of them in earlier items with the, uh, the budget review and the policy committee. Um, are there any others I am not thinking of at this time, though? Just a quick equity committee update. Oh, yes. Great. Do you want me to go ahead? Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm giving my time for the equity committee update over to Sean and Greg. Um, but before I do that, I just want to acknowledge the work of the teachers and the parents and the staff who are part of the equity committee because they have moved mountains um, to get professional development around equity issues into the school. And the first one took place today, which I obviously was not a part of, which is why Greg and Sean have agreed to talk. Very good. Go right ahead, Sean. That Greg was going to speak about this, but he left to go have dinner. So <laughs> I'll, I'll speak on his behalf. Um, we began our year-long equity journey. We have two Wednesdays a month that are dedicated to um, either a whole SAU equity meeting with the cooks who are working with us from Groundswell Change. And then on the alternate, alternating Wednesdays, the Ray School and Marion Cross School are going to work together to do professional development. Today, we had an introduction to what it is we're going to do throughout the year. We talked about multicultural education and what it meant to the participants and what it could mean to our, to our school and our curriculum. Um, we examined personal beliefs and any bias that people may hold coming into this work. And we set some, some ground, work, ground rules for how to have conversations that may be difficult and tricky for people to hear. So today was all about setting the stage. Uh, we are scheduled in two weeks to have a follow-up just with the two elementary schools. Um, I think the, uh, the thing that was interesting and fun today was that it was the first time since I've been at SAU 70 where the whole, um, all the schools came together to do something together. So it was nice just to work with colleagues from the other schools and hear perspectives and learn about what the curriculum may look like at the high school, the middle school, the race school, and, and just come together around a common issue. So I'm excited as the year goes on. I too have been part of the equity committee. Greg and I both have been. Uh, and it's nice to see all of the work that they've done come to, to fruition and, and result in something that's great for all of our schools. Um, I am encouraging the equity committee to work with Robin now to, in her role with curriculum and uh, staff development to see if we can start intertwining the equity work into some of the other things like the strategic planning and our um, long-term goals and then just weave it in that way. But it was a great start today and I feel like the next meeting will be even better having fewer people on the, the Zoom session and maybe we can get, a, get some more talk time and air time. And there's actually in a nutshell. Thanks for the overview. Lisa, do you have anything else you wanted to add? To? That's it. Thanks. Okay. Well, thanks for all the work you're doing on the equity committee too. It's obviously very important. I'm glad we're uh, getting this underway, even in spite of everything else going on, because it's uh, not something to push to the side. I'm glad we're uh, taking, uh, moving ahead with these training sessions, which uh, I'm excited to hear more about as we move forward into, uh, into more sessions. So thank you for arranging for that. And thanks for the update, Sean. Um, I, I did, uh, the negotiations committee hasn't met, but we have gone back and forth with the uh, teachers uh, uh, who are um, leading the uh, union team right now. That's Allison Litton, and uh, are just checking in on the status of uh, recent um, uh, proposals and are just waiting to hear back on that from the uh, contract that would be for this upcoming year. And uh, as uh, was mentioned earlier too, in the budget uh, meeting, we do have need to uh, um, re-engage with them for the up. Uh, the upcoming budget years uh, negotiations, as well as with the support staff too. So the uh, negotiations committee will reach out to them uh, for uh, meetings in the near future as well. And uh, we'll provide updates uh, to the board on that too. Uh, did I miss anything budget, uh, nor negotiations committee <laughs> colleagues, Neil or Jane? Okay. We'll provide updates on that as we move ahead then. Any other committee topics that should people like covered? Okay. 
Um, oh, sorry, Jamie, go right ahead. No, I didn't know. Um, I didn't know if Robin wanted to say anything about any of. She's been working on a lot of stuff too, and I think we yes. were remiss in giving her our own section to be able to share information. We're not yeah. used to having an assistant uh, superintendent. We're going to have to add in a spot for her to talk. I know, and thank you for uh, staying on for the full meeting here. I know you've been doing a lot of work with the task force and uh, myriad other things, Robin. And so. Uh, if you've got anything you'd like to add, please do. I have set up a meeting with members of the equity committee and they did a great job today with the presentation. I enjoyed that tremendously. And I've been working with the task force and starting to work with K through 12, trying to prepare for that. So I've got my hands in a lot of different areas <laughs> and staying very busy. <laughs> enjoying it, so. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you for your support and welcome again uh, to the district. Thanks for all you're doing right off the bat. You're welcome. And uh, I, we do have a new section here I've asked to have added for board correspondence. So as we get in messages uh, at, before meetings, we will start posting them here um, if they're directed toward the board so that we'll be able to review them at that point in time. Um, I actually, uh, we have listed here a need for non-public. I do not have need for non-public at this time, unless uh, I'll look to uh, Jamie and Sean. Is there anything from a personnel perspective that we need to address at this point? Okay. Um, if there are no other items, then um, we can move right down the list to agenda topics for the next meeting. I think we heard a lot uh, coming out of this meeting that I've got uh, on my list for our next meeting, but if anything, pops to your mind right now, please let me know. And if not, uh, anytime between now and two weeks from now when we have our agenda planning meeting, uh, please do get in touch with uh, me and or Sean, uh, Jamie and uh, Jay as we develop that, uh, that plan moving forward. And I do not have anything else uh, to add other than um, my continued eternal thanks for everything that everyone is doing to keep us in school safely and uh, and moving forward uh, while we try to get through all this together. Anything anyone else would like to add? And if not, I'm happy to entertain that final motion. Uh, Kelly. I'm making the motion unless there's anyone else who's adding anything. I move to adjourn. We have a second. Lisa, we'll do a roll call. Lisa. Christy, yes. Garrett? Palm, yes. Kelly? Percy, yes. Neil? Neil, yes. And Candon, yes. And thank you again, everyone. Thanks for taking the minutes tonight, as usual, Jessica. And uh, stay well. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.